recording just started, but I won't go through that again. Um, uh, good morning, my name's Peter Scott. I'm standing in for Jenny, who uh, who is not here. Um, welcome to the uh, 515th meeting of the Canterbury Regional Council. This meeting is not being live streamed, uh, but will be recorded and the recordings made available on the Council's website. We're using MS Teams, and so we have people uh, online. Um, uh, for today's Zone Committee, representatives will join us virtually for item 9.1. And I'd now like to ask uh, Councillor Pauling to do a mihi and then Councillor Hans to do a karakia. Craig. Tēnā tātā i rungi te āhotango te rā. Te wā makiri o te tau. Te wā hei ti aho mai nā whetu o Matariki o Puaka hoki. Ena iwi o Waitaha, ko hui bui mai nei, koutou e noho nei, koutou e mā takitaki nei, koutou e whakarungu nei, a tēnā tātou. A ki nga manuheri, kua tai mai nei i tēnei ata, ko Bex, o tō rōpū o Drinkable Waters hoki, a tēnei te mihi ki a koutou, ko Ken, tēnā koe mo tō whānau, Kia Simon, Hamish, Bruce, Rato, ai tēnei te mi kia koutou. Ki nga iho onioni, ringa raupā, o te kaunihera nei, a tēnā tātou. Ki nga kai kaunihera, aku haumi, a tēnei te mi kia koutou. Ka huri au te taku whakaaro, ki nga tini aitua, ku wehi atu ki te pō haere, haere, hari atu rā. Ai e nga mate, moi mai, moi mai. Oki oki mai. Apu te hono o tātou hono, toka mati ki toka mati, apu te hono o tātou hono. Rātou ki a rātou, tātou ki a tātou to hongo ora, a tēnā tātou. E mihi atu ki nga whetu tāraki o te rangi. Ki te mātai o kākau nui, Te uri o Tautahi, Peter Amston, kei te mihi au ki a koe. Ki nga tangata, a harata te aika, Trevor McGlinchey, nō Moiraki, ko Muriel Johnson, nō Murihaku, te kāhui Aroha Rerite Crofts. Kei te poho kereru au i tō iwi, a i tēnei kaunihera. Ai, kei te mihi atu au ki a koutou. A nō reira, koutou mā tēnā koutou. Just to translate so you understand, just standing to acknowledge everyone that's come here this morning for the meeting, especially our guests that are here to talk to us about their important issues and reports. So just welcoming you. Thank you for coming along. Um, to our staff, of course, uh, the continued hard work and, of course, the councils around the table just acknowledging everybody. Uh, also, just acknowledge those that have passed away. And in particular, just wanted to mention uh, the reason Jenny's not here today. She's had a death in her family and just sending our best wishes to her and her family at this time. Um, and also just finished off with acknowledging uh, some of the wonderful people that recently got uh, acknowledged through the Queen's Birthday Honours um, list, and in particular, someone that we're all really familiar with here around the table, Uncle Peter Ramson. Uh, he's been really heavily involved. He actually worked here at Environment Canterbury, uh, but he also had lots to do with the CWMS, uh, with Te Waihora, uh, with Te Ropu Tuia, and of course with his own uh, slice of paradise at Kaikarata at Port Levy. Um, I also mentioned Harata Tiaka from Te Tua Hiwi, uh, Trevor McGlinchey, who's from Moidaki, and also Muriel Johnson, who's actually a hearings commissioner that we use occasionally. Um, and lastly, to uh, Dame or Kahurangi, um, Aroha Rerite Crofts, so from Tuahiwi, I'm sure many of you know her as well. And just wanted to acknowledge them for their great achievements that they had recently. So, kia ora tātou. I'm going to hand over to Megan to do the karakia. Kia ora. Kia ora tātou. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kine kine ki uta, 
ke ma taratara ki tai. I he aki ana te atukura, i te o, te huka, e hauhu, te hei, mauri ora. Kia ora for that, uh, Megan and, and Craig, thank you for that mihi uh, to, to get us started today. So we'll move to item two on the agenda, which is apologies. And I've already we've already mentioned that Jenny's not here, but we'll record her as an apology for this meeting. Um, uh, and item three, uh, conflicts of interest. Are there any conflicts of interest for any items on this agenda that councillors might have? OK. So we move to item four, which is um, a deputation in our public uh, section uh, to be made by Bex de Prospo to the meeting. And so please come to the table, Bex. And I think you have others with you. Uh, welcome to the table also. Thank, thank you. So just the procedural stuff, Bex, around this is that you have 10 minutes to present your deputation to the councillors. Uh, and once you finish your presentation, councillors will use the opportunity to ask questions of you. Uh, and then we will move a recommendation based on your um, on, on your um, deputation. And you've done the button thing, so. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to thank you all for the opportunity to present to you today and the, the incredibly warm welcome that I got when I came in this morning. It's wonderful wonderful to see some familiar faces and some new ones as well. Um, we're here today just to give you an overview of our work and also to highlight some opportunities that we see for us to collaborate on one of the most important issues facing Christchurch, New Zealand and the world. So Drinkable Rivers is a movement led by real-time data, which focuses on the stories of New Zealand's waterways by giving our rivers a voice. Now, many of you will be familiar with our founder, Michael Mayle, local entrepreneur and passionate environmental advocate. Michael conceived of Drinkable Rivers as a moonshot vision of something truly aspirational that he wants to achieve in his lifetime. Ultimately, he thought targets aiming for swimmable rivers are simply not good enough. And our failure to reach those targets in the majority of our waterways pretty clearly reflects that. And so in 2018, Michael partnered with co-founder Anake Goodall and his social enterprise catalyst organization, Seed the Change, to sponsor the development and build of a prototype real-time water quality measuring device. A device which we hope and expect to be the first of many. This device, dubbed Oracle One, was sited at the head of the Atakoro Avon River in July of 2019. Since it was grounded last year, Oracle One began taking real-time measurements of a number of key indicators, including pH, nitrates, temperature, conductivity, dissolved oxygen, and redox. These measurements are taken every 30 minutes and are supplemented with regular manual E. coli tests. The data is currently being displayed in a dashboard, which you can access right now uh, through the data link on drinkablerivers.nz or directly through this URL, which, sorry, you can't actually see on the bottom of the screen there. Um, it's, uh, it's in its version 1.0 form, but our aspirations for it are considerable. We're currently working to secure funding to improve both, both its aesthetics and its functionality. Uh, our aim is to future-proof the display so that we can enable ourselves to add additional Oracle sensors and to aggregate other relevant data sources like the ones from ECAN, CCC, NIWA, Met Service, and so on. In its fully realized form, uh, the dashboard will provide a compelling snapshot view of our waterways real-time health for anyone to see while also providing the full robust open source data to be used for research and education. In December, we partnered with Villa Maria College in the development of a pilot Kaitiaki Tanga program, which focuses on core reserve and the riparian zone surrounding Oracle One. We're now working closely with their staff to craft learning outcomes, which provide cross-disciplinary opportunities for their students. Some of the tangible outcomes of this collaboration will include river reports and regular hands-on water testing, riparian planting and long-term maintenance of core reserve, collaborative crossover opportunities with other schools, such as the Urban Eel Program at Rusley Primary, and a collection of learning resources to support Villa in maintaining this kaitiaki role long into the future. 
Our intention with this pilot program is to create a self-sustaining roadmap, which can be adapted and applied for use with future oracles by additional groups in other sections of rivers in future years. In short, I hope to make myself redundant. Drinkable Rivers work is not in hands-on remediation as such, but rather in information, mobilization, and collaboration. We acknowledge and are humbled by the amazing work which is already being done in the water restoration space in Christchurch. And it is our goal to support that work in the best ways that we can. But we're storytellers. We're not scientists, we're not data experts. And so in order to do this work, we need the expertise and active collaboration of organizations like ECAM. So this is where we are now. Uh, we have our prototype sensor at the head of the Itakuro Avon River because we understand that this is where we have to start if we have any hope to restore the rest. But we're working quickly to find funding for additional sensors for the Avon, the Heathcote and beyond. Because it is with multiple data points that we can really start to add value and to achieve our vision of giving our rivers a voice. Organizations like ECAN and CCC have incredibly robust periodic data that is great for tracking trends over long periods of time. Our aim is to supplement that monitoring with the power of real-time data, which is particularly useful during different weather and contamination events. So say we have a major storm event, and a half hour later, our sensors show a spike in a particular contaminant. It's registering across the Itakuro Avon River, but we can quickly see that it spikes here near Winoni. With that information, we know that it's being introduced somewhere east of Richmond. These results and supporting tests over time can help us to isolate contamination issues. Maybe something's being introduced through Dudley Creek or on a stormwater drain on Avonside Drive. Suddenly, we begin to have a much clearer picture of our waterways and what they're telling us. And we can then make use of these innovative sensors to help us make decisions on where and how best to focus restoration efforts to improve the health of our rivers. And throughout this process, we will provide this high quality real-time data to those that can best make use of it in the community. Water quality is very topical in New Zealand right now, and the space is fairly crowded. We're working to support some of the key players who are already in this space, and we hope to be able to provide these groups with real-time data to inform remediation work in their local areas. Currently, we're supporting them through established initiatives like the Mother of All Cleanups, which we helped to deliver remotely this year and for which we will be taking a more active role in the organization team in 2021. We're also actively engaged with the progress of ECAN supported initiatives like the Community Water Partnership. On the other side, we're also establishing links and actively working on collaborative projects with commercial and tourism focused organizations like these and creating collaborative opportunities for learning and well-being with initiatives like these. Because we see the incredible educational health and commercial potential of having thriving rivers running through the heart of Christchurch. And in creating these links across sectors, we hope that we can best serve both our waterways and our citizens. Like everyone else, uh, we're working quickly to reprioritize and structure the rest of 2020 in light of COVID-19 but our core objectives remain the same. Getting both our software and our hardware optimized, further development in our partnership with Bill and Maria, uh, and in creating that framework for a self-sustaining program, which we can roll out to other groups, and continuing to really build on those collaborative relationships. To date, ECAN has been quite supportive of Drinkable Rivers' work, and we're eager to continue and expand upon the work we've already done together. We need funding resources to enable us to continue this challenging and important work, specifically support in applying for initiatives like the Immediate Steps Fund uh, and guidance on other funds and any relevant changes to allocations and timelines in light of COVID-19. We also need human and informational resources to help us access and interpret your existing water quality data so that we can then bring that data to the community. A key point of contact within ECAN to liaise with drinkable rivers in these areas would inform our work and enhance our ability to support your work. The issues facing our waterways are complex and urgent, and we know that we need everyone to be a part of an active solution. 
I just want to thank you for taking the time today to learn about Drinkable Rivers, and we are so grateful for you in helping us achieve our vision to give our rivers a voice. We look forward to building greater links for collaboration between Drinkable Rivers and ECAN, and we would welcome any questions that you might have for myself or other members of our team. Thank you. Well, before we ask you the question, just thank you very much for bringing this in. This is what this section is for, is to inform us in terms of things that are going on in our community, and I'm sure there are plenty of questions. So, thank you very much, Bex, for your presentation. Um, and I was especially interested in the way your group are looking at collaborating, collaborating with others, and you're doing it in Villa Maria. Well, the primary school is a really good example. So I just wanted to. Um, I, I'm the the councillor rep on the Christchurch West Melton Zone Committee, and we're all on zone committees. And I just wondered, would there be a what? Um, I'd hope there'd be a way that perhaps our zone committee, who may others may already know, I'm sure, about you. But in fact, I'm wondering if the zone committees might be able to be sort of a, also a conduit group for yourselves. Um, I'll, I'll kind of hazard a clear on that. Actually yeah, been... We're recording. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I'll pass over to Claire from our team on that one because she's actually already, uh, and actually Russell as well, have had the opportunity to, to speak to the West Mountain zone committee. Mm. Well, we actually, uh, we've spoken to the community board actually. Oh, sorry. So uh, we'd welcome to be able to speak to the com uh, zone committee. Hi, oh, yes. I've just got a comment and three questions. Um, so I'm not sure if you're aware of the Building Trust project, which the um, Lower Waitaki um, Zone Committee, um, I think, are piloting. Um, this is an open source, open data project for the public, um, and it is just with regional council data. Um, it might be just something to be aware of, thinking about how you might integrate in the future with that, potentially. Um, but I've got questions around um, <coughs> Uh, I suppose some specific questions. Um, how much funding are you are you after, um, and um, specifically what sort of data? And the other question I have would be: um, Are you thinking about looking at other target compounds in the future, adding to your repertoire of things that you're monitoring? Um, I'm happy to answer, but I also don't want to take, take up all the airspace. Um, we absolutely so. Uh, it, with regard to your second question, we are we're effectively still at a prototype stage with this first device and are very much looking at are we measuring the right things? Are we can we expand that data set? Are there things we don't need? We're also aware that there are now uh, on the North Island people who are actually looking at real time E. coli, which is, would be new for us and something quite exciting. Um, Obviously, with real-time measurement, the more you do, the more expensive it becomes. Um, so that sort of directly informs that funding question. Um, but one of the biggest challenges for us in this year is that the funding rounds that were expected to be open mid-year with CCC that might have been quite a good fit for us are now in flux because of all the, the challenges around COVID-19. Um, so ultimately, I think our key deliverables that were sort of the immediate horses off the rank are to get that data dashboard working the way we want it to so that we can add more sensors and also just getting more hardware in the river so we can get more data points. Now, maybe it's not a, a another Oracle device in full. Maybe it's a, a you know, a, a number of smaller sensors that are doing specific elements. So we're quite adaptable to how we might roll that out um, and are obviously quite understanding that the landscape is still ever changing this year. Yeah, even this week. <laughs> Hey, thank, thank you for that um, that answer, this great answer. So, Councillor Farm. Thank you, Bex and team, for um, your presentation and being here today. Um, and thank you so much for your work in this space. Um, anything that helps bring our much beloved, but we know heavily degraded urban waterways to life for people is just such valuable work, and I just really appreciate it. Um, Thank you as well for knowing your role and really being conscious about where you can add value. I think that's really critical in this space when we know where there's a lot of people wanting to do that. Um, but I think the the area that you've honed in, in is a really, really valuable area. Um, I think, I, I guess I just had a follow up in terms of Liz's question about funding and, and the key deliverables that we can help you with. And I just wrote down briefly, you, you mentioned like having a key contact with an ECAN. Um, and also support with sort of interpreting our data so that you can help sort of display that for the community. And then we've of course got the funding considerations. I just wanted to note today we're um, adopting our annual plan, but we'll be going into long-term plan deliberations in the lead up to decisions next June. 
So it's kind of like we're sort of right in between in terms of funding for this cycle, but next year for consideration. Um, question. My question was, oh, well, I just saw nods, but it was about those key deliverables that we can help you with in terms of the key contact. And is that is that accurate or is there more? Uh, no, I think that's a really, really great place to start. We, As I say, we have been really fortunate in our dealings with ECAM so far. Everyone has actually been quite eager and willing to help us, but it has been a bit ad hoc. Um, and I know that some people who are helping us are doing it sort of uh, above and beyond the things that are expected of them in their in their standard roles. So it would be great for us to have a key point of contact, particularly around the data. So for, for community organizations like ourselves, we're, we're time poor. We're doing a lot on not a lot of budget. And so to have a key point of contact who can help us decipher what's already being measured, making sure we're not duplicating efforts, help us to interpret the data we've got and the data that you've got and help us to actually plan that rollout of additional sensors uh, because we don't want to be doubling up on efforts that are already being well covered by ECAN. We want to make sure that we're actually supplementing and being additive. Um, so having a key contact for that is really, really key, I think. Um, does anybody want to add anything to that? Look, thank you for that. Look, I'm conscious that we're, we're about the end of what we're going to do, but I'm also conscious that, that maybe there's some other comment from the table if you want to make it before we finish. Yeah, hi, look. Um, Thanks for uh, having us today and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I just want to thank you, Bex, for an amazing presentation, as always. Um, I just wanted to add a couple of things to what's been said, and that is that we're not going to get the Avon River drinkable, swimmable unless we can engage the entire community, right? And that's our role, our job. We see ourselves as in the business of helping every Christchurch resident to get engaged with the river. And so one of the things that we've done um, is that we've just recently created a history of the Avon River movie. We were going to show it today, but it was going to put us over time, so we haven't. Um, but when we do release it, we would love support from you guys to socialise it. Um, it is an incredible piece of work, and I think you're all going to be very impressed with, with this video. Um, and, yeah, I think that's really all I wanted to add. So thank you for having us and uh, look forward to having a, a drink. Thank you. Um, and we'll, so we'll move to our recommendations here, which which should give you some comfort because our chief executive is actually uh, also a um, pretty good scientist. So, so, our, <laughs> so, so our, our recommendations are these, um, which I'll put to the vote. So the first recommendation is that we receive your deputation uh, Bex, uh, regarding drinkable rivers, and the second recommendation is that Chief Executive be requested to investigate the matters raised. So I'll put that to those. All those in favour? Uh, All those against? Yeah, oh, sorry. Sorry. Still got my training wheels on here. Um, so I'm over. So Nicole's going to move that. Megan's going to second it. All those in favour? Uh, All those against? Carried. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You're, free. You're free to go. Okay, thank you. So now we're up to item five on our agenda, and uh, which is the minutes from the meeting from the 14th of May, 2020. And those minutes are on pages nine to 15. And I would ask, once you get there, I would ask uh, if there are any matters of accuracy relating to these minutes. So I recognise that, that uh, the council confirms as a true and correct record and adopts the minutes of the meeting held on the 14th of May 2020. Can I have someone to move, Liz? Uh, sorry, Councillor McKenzie and a seconder, Councillor Mackay. All those in favour? Aye. All those against? Carried. So we now move to the 14th of May. Public yeah, the 14th of May 2020 public excluded the minutes from the public excluded part of this meeting can be confirmed in, in this open meeting. Uh, page 16 of your agenda. And again, are there any matters of accuracy relating to these minutes? If not, I'll put the recommendation uh, that we can. Yeah, yeah. So the I'll read the recommendation. 
feel more comfortable doing that actually. Confirms uh, it's a true and correct record tops the minutes of part of the meeting held with the public speed on the 20th of May. Moved by Councillor Clearwater, seconded by Councillor Edge. All those in favour? Carry. And we now move to uh, the 21st of May, pages 17 to 25 of the agenda. And again, are there any matters of accuracy relating to these minutes? Uh, Mr. Chair, there's a couple of typos on page 22, um, which I will correct in the sign minutes. Okay. Yeah. Is everybody happy with that? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so again, the recommendation uh, confirms as a true and accurate record and adopts the minutes of the meeting on the 21st of May 2020. Uh, I'm over, please. Councillor Farm, seconder, Councillor Hands. All those in favour? Those against carried. And again, another set of minutes. The 21st of May 2020, public excluded. And again, on pages 26 and 27 of the agenda. And we're also looking at this for matters of accuracy. Uh, the recommendation that the council confirms a true and correct record and adopts the minutes as part of the meeting held with public excluded 21st of May 2020. Can I call from MOVA? Thank you, Councillor Edge and Councillor Hand. Seconded. All those in favour? Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, now we move to item six. Um, matters arising from those minutes that we've just uh, discussed. Are there any matters from <coughs> those minutes? Councillor Bourne. Um, I just wanted to really acknowledge Louise and um, just to say thanks for accommodating sort of the sort of an overview of the mihi that uh, we do at the start of the meeting. Um, thank you for that. And um, I just wanted to raise that you might notice that in the minutes that you've just agreed to, um, we've got a subtle change that it's not just it doesn't just say cut care anymore. Um, and I just sort of had raised this with Jenny and Louise that. It's not just a karakia that we do at the start of the meeting and at the end. Um, it's actually a mihi as well, so we sort of changed the words. But we might just have to um, keep looking at it because I did notice it's not quite consistent across the minutes. So we'll just keep working on that. But it's just um, just a note that we do a mihi and a karakia and these sort of different roles for that. And especially the way we did it today when we've got two different people doing that. So um, just want to acknowledge, Louise, thank you for accommodating that. And um, yeah, thank you. So just a point of clarification, Councillor pulling on the mihi, do you intend the mihi to be in the minutes? No, not the full mihi, but there has been a summary of late. There has been a summary of late. And because if we do have important things to acknowledge, like we did most of the time there is, I think that's important that some of that gets noted. So Louise has been doing a great job on that. Um, it was more about the heading, actually. The headings are important, and, and that, that transfers into our agendas now as well. Anyway, that can support any other matters arising that councillors want to speak on. All right, so we'll move to item seven, uh, the committee reports and the performance audit and risk committee minutes of 30th of April 2020. Now pages 29 to 60 of the agenda and I'll hand over to Councillor Sunkel. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, you will note uh, a number of recommendations uh, coming from that committee meeting. If I could first ask that those committee members, uh, if someone could please move that uh, these minutes be a, a true and accurate record. Thank you, Councillor Mackay. Seconded, uh, Councillor Ian McKenzie. All those in favour, say aye. aye. Against carried. Um, we have a number of recommendations there, and I'll speak briefly to, to the paper and, and then seek a seconder or the like. So uh, we have uh, <coughs> so we received uh, and confirmed the record. We have uh, approved that the chair of Canterbury Regional Council sign the audit engagement letter, which is an important part of the process through audit. Uh, the next um, item number three is around the costs on behalf of uh, that process. Uh, we, item four approves the revised liability management investment policy, uh, a piece of work we workshopped pri prior to the PAR committee. And so our recommendation is that uh, council approves it. Uh, that piece of work uh, is further on in their papers. Uh, it notes the uh, the summary of our financial reports to the period ending 30th of April and notes any resolution, resolutions made. I, I take uh, the majority of the report as, as read, but note we did have a conversation around uh, uh, risk and, and 
internal audits that we might pursue over the next uh, 12 months and, and going forward in, in a matter of prioritisation. Um, nothing else, so I will uh, move those, uh, those six recommendations, one through six, and seek a seconder. Thank you, Ian McKenzie. I pass back to the Chair for any questions. So all those, in, oh, sorry, sorry, any discussion around those comments made, all those minutes that uh, so, okay. All those in favour? Aye. All those against? Carry. Thank you. So we now move to item 7.1.2, which is the Regulation Hearing Committee, and that's on pages 61 to 68 of your agenda, and this item is to be presented by Councillor Claire Mackay. Thank you, Chair. I'll take the papers as read there, um, and if people note there is a typo that will be corrected on page 6. One. Um, also, these uh, papers, or the second um, lot of minutes there for the Regulation Hearing Committee dated the 21st of May is now confirmed. So, um, I think it's pretty self explanatory what we're looking at there. We're looking at um, appointment of hearing commissioners for the Waste Management um, Limited Consent Application. And on the meeting for the 21st of May, we uh, appointed some hearing commissioners that will sit on non-notified applications for the next 12 months and also a hearing commissioner for another application um, that was under objection. So if there's any points of clarification or questions anybody would raise, happy to take those. Thank you, Lan. Is there a second after that motion? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Marshall. All those in favour? Aye. All those against? Sorry, sorry. It's, yeah, all those against, Gary. Councillor McKenzie. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, uh, through you, uh, Councillor Kai, when has the, has the been a date established yet for this hearing to start? On the waste, the waste management? Consent. No, there has been no date uh, at the stage. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we'll now move on to item 7.1.3, which is the Chief Executive Employment uh, Performance and Remuneration, Remuneration Committee, which is on page 69 to, to 71. Of the agenda, there's one recommendation there that has received an unconfirmed, the unconfirmed minutes from the meeting of the Chief Executive Employment Performance and Remuneration Committee held on the 9th of June 2020. And I'll just ask for a, a mover and a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Clearwater, and a seconder. Councillor McKenzie, Ian McKenzie, all those in favour? No. Those against, carried. So now moving to statutory committees. Um, the first of these is the Canterbury Regional Transport Committee, which I need to speak to, and it's on pages 72 to 80 of the agenda. Um, uh, there's a couple of recommendations there in terms of uh, the, the unconfirmed minutes and the terms of reference for the Canterbury uh, Regional Transport Committee. I'd just like to speak that in terms of what was going on at the meeting. So the meeting really just um, talked about the development of the re Regional Land Transport Plan. Uh, we, are, uh, we are across the region in terms of COVID recovery. Uh, the Transport Agency Investment Plan, which is a, a, a pretty um, a serious piece of work that needs to be done there, it's going to be delayed. It should have been done, but it's going to be delayed because of COVID. Uh, and then there was an NZD, NZTA update, but essentially the first piece of uh, information that we want to get across to Council is the terms of reference uh, note they have changed uh, in terms of the attached paper, uh, which is on page 78. And there's a couple of um, just uh, key changes. One is um, uh, that the, um, the direction from the mayoral forum will be observed more by the regional Land Transport uh, Committee, they have a, a willingness to, to uh, become more involved in that space, which is a really, really good thing. And the second thing uh, I guess I've noticed that uh, this committee has always had trouble getting in uh, a forum. Uh, it, it, it 
that sometimes late in the day and and uh, and a quorum, sorry, not a forum, easy enough to get a forum. Um, and so we, what, what we're wanting to do, what we've done in, in terms of moving the quorum from nine down to seven, uh, because it's a standing committee and you can't have substitutes, uh, then we, we think it's more suitable that it's at seven rather than nine. So with that explanation, I'd move uh, uh, that we receive the unconfirmed minutes of the Canberra Regional Transport Committee held on the 21st of May 2020 and approve the terms of reference with the Canberra Regional Transport Committee. I'll move that. Have I seconded? Uh, thank you, Councillor Apanui. Um, all those in favour? All those against? Carry. Thank you. Now, moving to uh, 7.3, which is joint committees, and the first of those is the Greater Christchurch Public Transport Joint Committee, and I'll hand over to Councillor Clearwater. Councillors, this was the, the first um, meeting that the Joint PT Committee had had this term, um, and I, I guess it also my recollection is we had a workshop as well as the um, but I, I think what was important in this report was we get the standard um, monitoring report, and at that time we were we had not gone into um, COVID, of course, so it was a useful comparison for our, our following meeting. Um, but as you know, the monitoring report showed a big decline in um, patronage. The and the timeline though part is very helpful, in so that in fact, um, yeah. The, we have we've got a clear timeline for the work that the um, this committee is doing. But you'll be aware that this committee also works strongly in conjunction with the Greater Christchurch Partnership Committee as well around these, particularly the public transport operations. Thank you, uh, Councillor Kevin. Would you like to move the? Um, you'll move that um, the recommendation receives unconfirmed minutes. The Greater Christchurch Public Transport Joint Committee held on the 19th of February 2020. Have a second. Uh, thank you, Councillor Apanui. All those in favour? All those against? Carried. So now we've got, got um, a report uh, on the working group. So um, number eight. This is uh, item eight, 8.11, and it's on pages of your agenda. It was on pages 86 to 89, and uh, the planting regeneration working group will be reported on by Councillor Paul. Kia ora, Anul Koutou. Um, firstly, just want to acknowledge um, the great work that our staff have done on this, uh, particularly led by Nadine, um, and that we know that this, on, this is on top of existing work, so I just want to acknowledge that, so thank you very much. Um, so, yet we had our second meeting um, on the 3rd of June and discussed four main topics. Um, firstly, and you can see that in the minutes that are there, uh, firstly it was around the scope for the work program coming forward, which is really focused on an initial discovery phase involving a stock take of what's happening, uh, the capacity and interest and lessons learnt, and that's both from our internal work that ECAN does as well as other uh, community groups. Um, we've also started some kickstart um, activities in terms of looking at what the capacity of nurseries is, as well as starting to make contact with some key landowners and community groups. Um, we also talked about uh, uh, drafting up a high level value proposition so that, that can be used to communicate with others going forward. Uh, we also looked at some uh, opportunities, some early opportunities on ECAN land. Um, what's going to come happen next um, is some that we'll get the results of the stock tech coming in soon and that will We'll identify key opportunities and then that will feed into the long term plan uh, discussions going forward. So, Jolda, I'll move that uh, the council receives the paper of the working the notes, the minutes. So, it's been moved by um, council appalling that the council receives the report from the planning uh, regeneration working groups. We have a second of that. Thank you, Councillor Farm. All those in favour? All those against? Carried. And and he will take questions. Sorry, I'm rushing a bit. Okay, uh, item 8.1.2, uh, Public Visibility Working Group, uh, pages 90 to 95 of the agenda, and Councillor Marshall is to present this. Thank you. Um, so, uh, like Craig, I really want to thank um, staff that have been involved with this, Taplin, our Director of Communications and Engagement, and Catherine, our Director of Planning and Policy. Uh, it's been fantastic to work closer with you, and I'm really enjoying um, 
the rapport our wee group has got going. Um, so also like Craig, we've met twice. Uh, the first group was uh, bringing together the ideas that council had around public engagement and visibility and really identifying what the core priorities were out of that. Um, the second uh, meeting was just expanding a bit more on that uh, to, to get to a place where we all as a team felt comfortable that we had a clear understanding of moving forward. Um, our next step is going to be a joint councillor staff <coughs> workshop um, to make sure everyone's on the same page in terms of what our priority actions um, and achievements can be in this space. Uh, and then that will be an open invite to council when, when that is scheduled, um, obviously around <laughs> sometime over the next couple of months. Um, I'm happy to take questions, um, but I'll also move the recommendation that council receives this report. I think what we'll do is we'll move it and uh, get a seconder for this. Uh, so receives the report from the Public Visibility Working Group, moved by Councillor Marshall, seconded by Councillor Southworth. All those in favour? All those against? Carried. Is there any questions for Councillor Marshall? You got off lightly. Maybe, maybe we can dig on you a bit more in the in the in the future. Um, so now we move on to uh, item nine, which is. Um, uh, uh, a bit more interesting than this dry old stuff we've been doing, uh, which is the uh, Canterbury Water Management Strategy Annual Reports. Uh, they are included on pages 96 to 130 on the agenda, and the item will be introduced by Councillor Mackay. Thank you, Chair. Yes, sorry. Okay, it's been suggested to me by Louise that I um, that I introduce the, the batting order, if you like. So first first up will be uh, uh, the Hurunui Wild Zone, followed by uh, the uh, Harari Tamika Opehi Parigora Zone, Low Waitaki Zone, and then Upper Waitaki Zone. Thank you very much. Um, yes, look, it's my pleasure to introduce this. Um, item today around the Canterbury Water Management Strategy Annual Reports. And this is the last of a series of annual reports. We've got four zone committees today. And um, unfortunately, we have, well, fortunately, we've got Ken Huey, <laughs> who's the chair of the Hiranui Wai Zone Committee in the room. And we have, I hope, got everybody on line. Bruce is there as well, because I've yes. seen Hamish. Oh, and Bruce is with Dave. All oh, right. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Louise, for that. So we've got um, Bruce Murphy, we've got Simon Cameron, and Hamish McFarlane online. So that's great that they've all been able to attend in this hybrid uh, version that we're actually running here. Um, there is a, a requirement that zone committees actually do present these reports to uh, Environment Canterbury and also the TA partners on an annual basis, and that's where that is. And it's also an opportunity for the chiefs to come along and tell us, as ECAN councillors here, um, what's been happening in their community and their initiatives in freshwater space. So, can I hand over to you? Oh, I'm going to hand it back to you. You are, apparently. That's what it says here anyway. So, well, <laughs> welcome, Ken, um, and it's really good to see you here. And apologies from Jenny, she was really disappointed at the fact that she wouldn't be here today to entertain her cousin, <laughs> which, which is great. And and the, the other good thing is that we will have a meal at half past 12, so, um, you know, that you're lucky the others are going to have to fend for themselves. Um, look, this is a part that we really look forward to because it gives us that interaction with chairs and we don't get together all that often. So looking forward to your report. Uh, we'll, following your presentation, we'll have the, a question time from councillors. So we're in your hands. So you. And your button, Ken. Yep, thank you, Mr Chair. And I do want to acknowledge uh, Councillor Claire Mackay, who of course is the Regional Council's representative on our Zone Committee, and a very positive contribution that she makes to the functioning of that committee. So thank you very much, Claire. I'm going to take the annual report as read. I'm reminded that somewhat it is a matter of history. Um, it's been and done, um, but there are lessons in amongst that. Um, but I thought what I would probably do is, in taking that as read, just send you some signals about where we're heading at the moment and the degree of engagement that we're undertaking. 
uh, around where we're heading. So um, I do want to note by way of context and most of you will, I think, know this, uh, that Hiranui uh, Waio is the longest running of the zone committees. It's been there for 10 years. Uh, I was one of the foundation members, and one might well ask, why are you still there? Um, <laughs> and that is indeed a good question, but mostly I enjoy it, and I think mostly we make a contribution to what are really difficult um, deliberations and issues that all zones face in, in different ways. But in that first 10 years, I, I think the way I look back is that it was really a regulatory phase. It was engaging with the community to sort out what the priorities were, to get those into a zip and zipper and plans, and to get those plans in place with the assistance, obviously, of the regulatory agencies led by Environment Canterbury, supported by Hudanui District Council. And I think now that we have those in place, it's a matter of now thinking about what phase two of the zone committee like, might look like going forward. And so we've embarked on the way we describe it as a sort of a six month refreshing um, process. It's about thinking what our priorities might be. It's about working really closely with Environment Canterbury and, and Hiranui District Council. And I can tell you we are. I uh, spent a good number of hours on Monday and other days over the previous weeks working with both councils. And I think we're getting onto a onto a page where there's a level of comfort starting to emerge, at least amongst the councils and myself. Um, but that doesn't then mean that we haven't got a lot more work to do. And, and I, I look, for example, to uh, Councillor Pauling, and, and thank you, Craig, for acknowledging me um, earlier on. Um, but there's also a huge requirement here to engage with the Runanga. Um, and, of course, we're looking for the revised terms of reference uh, for zones generally and our zone in particular to lead us down that phase two pathway with a little bit more certainty about what the parameters of that work are. And the way we're starting to envisage that work, I think, is around doing. So regulation, sort of first 10 years, getting the framework roughly right. It's never going to be perfect. We saw that with the dry land farming issue, the 90% rule. But then thinking about where we're going ahead to is probably something we can be a little bit more certain about. Mr Chair, we can't share that with you today. Uh, we've got more work to do on that page and we're looking at a Zoom meeting hopefully in a week after next uh, and then another workshop in a couple of weeks um, and hopefully we'll start to form that up a little bit further. But we still have to acknowledge um, that that all needs to be agreed and supported by the Runanga, by the Regional Council, um, and of course by H HDC before we embark on that program of work. So I think the other, my last point, Mr Chair, would be to say um, we have probably had a, a rather rough um, last 18 months, you know that. I think we're working our way through that and we've welcomed the process of doing that. And I suppose in my role now as chair, it's trying to make sure that we involve all of the right people around the table, that we're all buying into the refresh and that the refresh takes a variety of forms. It's not just about the work we do. It's about engaging all of the willing parties that we know exist in Hiranui and Waio. And we're up for a full refresh of the zone committee. So I'm looking forward um, to that work. I think it builds on what we've done in the past, Mr Chair, and would welcome any questions. Thank you. Look, thanks. thanks for bringing all that energy into the room. <laughs> um, that, you know, that sometimes people are a bit down on these things, but I'll ask are there questions. So, uh, Councillor Mackay. Not so much a question, but I really would like um, to thank Ken for the honesty and, and you know, and the acknowledgement that it's a pretty hard role between a zone committee member and the chair in trying to um, herd the cat, so to speak. I think one of the things that I, I just asked you, perhaps if you could expand on for people's benefits around the um, splash project and the work that was done in Hill and um, in Wales. Thank you, um, Claire. So um, not too many people will know, but I'm a mad keen swimmer, um, open water swimmer, uh, pool swimmer and, and the like. Um, and actually I swim a lot in the rivers in North Canterbury, and I include in that space the Waimakariri, so it's good to see that I can do that. But the Splash Project has, has brought the opportunity um, to, I guess, um, reawaken the opportunities that do exist 
in our major North Canterbury rivers, whether they be the larger rivers like the Huranui or Waio Ufa, or some of the smaller tributary uh, rivers like the Waitoi, for example. So um, we have a, a list of those rivers of the places where we know people have swum in the past or swim now. And we've got a program that we're working with the zone implementation team, with the district council and others to reposition those places, uh, to make them work better, uh, to reduce the faecal coliform counts as we had to in the Balmoral area that involved killing a whole lot of um, southern blackback gulls. But it's also part of public awareness uh, and making sure that those opportunities are well known. So I think, Claire, we know there's more work to be done in that space, but we're making really good progress on that. And I think that's part of a bigger amenity value project where we'll start to look at access provisions, uh, uh, one that's dear to me given my background in the Parnassus area, and I'll put this one on the table, um, is having some sort of foot access, because I don't own a jet boat, um, some form of foot access to the mouth of the Waio Ufa River, uh, because actually I'm told it's a fantastic place to go, um, but I can't really get there. So. Um, that's thinking about the greater amenity values. The splash project is a key part of that, but it's just one of the planks. Thank you, Ken. Um, really good to hear that, you know, the Zone Committee and yourself feel like you're really in the doing phase. And that's really where my question revolves around. I mean, do you feel like, like where would be the one area that you feel like maybe the council could be supporting you better in the doing phase? And I mean, that's a really wide breadth, but I, I wanted to keep it wide. If, if you feel like there are areas where we could be specifically doing more. I hate saying this, but these are all great questions. Um, that is a challenging question because I think um, probably the, over the course of the last two, three, maybe five years, we perhaps haven't been as joined at the hip as well as we could have been, both with ECAN and with HDC. I think we've opened probably over the course of the last year or so, uh, new opportunities in that space. So I don't see any one thing as being required there. I think it's really an expression of willingness and then following up with that willingness on an agreed course of action, which we sit down as mature adults and we thrash out around a table. And certainly the meetings I had on Monday, um, both uh, the meeting with HDC and um, uh, senior staff and with ECAN was demonstrative of that. Then when we had the zone committee only workshop, I saw the same thing. And then when we had the public meeting, I saw the zone implementation team leadership stepping up to the plate. And, and I see all of those stars beginning to align. So uh, yes, I'm a bit gung ho, um, but actually I, I'm a glass half full person and I see a, a great degree of potential in that space. And I think it's starting to happen. So it's not one single thing. Just quickly, um, do you, you mentioned recreation amenity values, which is something that um, the CWMS is, you know, hope, hopefully will advance a wee bit. But do you think in this new um, action phase that that will come to the fore a bit more? I'm thinking of um, some stuff I'm doing with Post Quake Farming Group, Agri Tourism, um, Huranui Tourism, and recreational opportunities. Yeah, thanks, Grant. Um, Absolutely, the answer is yes. I, th I think there there could be some people who might expect us to have, and I won't say surprisingly, but it might appear that way at first sight, a, a biodiversity, biodiversity only focus. But that's not the sole focus of the CWMS. So we're increasingly seeing it, um, including that amenity focus and we see the amenity values in North Canterbury and in Huranui Waio as being actually really important to diversifying the space within which tourism exists. And so if I think about what might be happening in the Hamna Basin, we're already talking um, really actively with the zone implementation team about jobs for nature work, which would then lead into tourism related opportunities, but are linked to amenity, whether they be walks, whether they be swims, whether they be other activities. Similar initiatives could occur in the Cheviot area and many other spaces. So absolutely, yes, I, I see this as all being part of that package. Great. Thank you. Um, 
I've got a couple of comments I'd like to make, uh, Jerry. I mean, I'd like to acknowledge our facilitator. I think it's Andrew Arps in this area, and also, sorry, Lynn. Lynn, I see you're there, Lynn, actually. I got that wrong. Um, and my apologies for getting that wrong. So, Lynn, you also cover OTOP. Um, so, thank you for being in the room. Uh, it, gives you, it gives you a sense of uh, th this discussion, which is great. But I'd like just like to say, Ken, thank you very much. I mean, you're a bit of a warrior in this space, really, in terms of uh, the time that you've spent here. But I'd like you to be able to just take back to your own committee, also add thanks as a council for the work they're doing. It's not easy sometimes in terms of how, how we navigate our way around these things. And you understated yourself in saying that was a difficult space over the last few years. So thank you very much. So, so thank you, Mr Chair. And by gosh, I have to apologise. I had to do that the other day. I had written down here in bold caps, thank you, Lynn. And I never said anything. So thanks for reminding me. I'll look around. I say thank you, Lynn, not just for the coffee this morning, but for all the great work you were doing and, and helping us chart this course. She's absolutely fantastic. And uh, long may that last and, and flourish. So thank you very much, Mr Chair and Council. Thank, thank you, Ken. Um, and now we're going uh, online. And Ken, you're going to, you will stay for lunch with us. Uh, yeah, this will environment record evidence to do with the Hawke's Bay River due to close of play. We'll see how we go. Good on you. <laughs> Thank you. So are you there, Andrew? I think Dave is, are you at home, Andrew? Or are you with, uh, sorry, Hamish? Hello. Hello, Pete. Oh, you're on your own, Hamish. I am. So welcome, Hamish. So Hamish is the chairman of the OTOP zone and and as I say, I also acknowledge Lynn sitting in the background. So, Hamish, we're in your hands. Um, we've got, we seem to have uh, plenty of time, but, but you know, we'll do this between now and about sort of five past or maybe a bit longer. So, over to you. All right, thank you, Peter. Uh, kia ora, Tenakato Council. Um, I'd just like to kick this off briefly by saying a big thank you to Councillor McKenzie and our District Council community and Runanga Rep. So, um, I'd like to thank them very much for the work they've put in and also to Lynn, who's been facilitating us for the last wee while. So thank you very much, Lynn, and uh, thank you for getting me organised to be on here. Um, Lynn put me very nicely behind Ken, thinking he'd break the ice for me, but I think it's pretty hard act to follow. So um, nice to hear some positive comments out of there, Ken. Thank you. Hey, um, this is about the annual report, obviously. Um, I'm happy to take that as read um, and... Are there any questions that the council members have got for me regarding that report or anything else they may like to bring up? Well, maybe there are, Hamish, but maybe you could do um, also just a generalised um, comment in terms of where you're at with at the moment with OTOP. But, I mean, the report is the one in terms of the last 12 months. I guess that, that that's the most important thing here. So is any councillors... So, so we've got Councillor Farm that has a question. Thank you, Hamish. I thought I'd have a go at um, sparking off some comments from you. Um, thank you again for your work in this space. It's been, yeah, really, I'd say fun, actually, um, my time on OTOP with you. So thanks for hanging in there. Um, I guess I just wanted to follow up. I'm glad you heard um, our conversation with Ken um, in terms of my question to him about the doing and how he can, could support that better in terms of zone committees actually taking action on the ground. And really, um, he highlighted an agreed course of action or a agreed direction moving forward is a really key um, place that we could get to. And that is an area that um, council are really turning our minds to. And the, the zone committee will, of course, be part of that conversation in the next few weeks. I'm just wondering if you, if your thoughts are in the same space or whether OTOP has sort of differing views about where ECAN could really help support the zone committee? Thank you, Leanne. That's a very good question and, um, and a great segue to get into a couple of comments I'd, I'd like to make. So if you don't mind, I'll give you a wee bit of background about where we are as a committee and then I'll come back and answer that question, yeah. which I think is a great one about what to do for the future. So, Thank hey, you. look, we have... Um, I guess to reiterate what Ken said to a degree is we have moved out of a very regulatory space where we have been consulting with community, developing the zipper and and I guess smoothing the way a bit wee bit for PC7 and and I guess in the interim we've had the NPS come through which has ch potentially changed the balance a wee bit of 
or created a wee bit of uncertainty maybe about where um, how things are going to be rolled out in our area. Um, now, as a follow-on from that, there has been, I, I'd, I'd call it a, a stalemate within the committee for a while about in what direction we go, how we get there, and, and what tools we've got available to actually get us to um, some of the ideals that we've all got as committee members. But we had a, quite an interesting meeting about a fortnight ago, um, which was quite it was a committee only workshop, but it was a, a very good chance for the committee to sit there and really um, work through our issues and prove that we could work together as a committee. And I think we needed that time just to, to, to make sure that we had some of those relationships there that we could talk about things and actually get to an outcome. So it was quite a settling sort of a meeting, I would have um, been my read on it. Um, and and I, so some of the things that came out of that, um, which um, we put out as a formal uh, zone committee uh, minutes, I shouldn't say formal, but on the back of the workshop, where I guess the key thing was there's still support for collaboration there um, as the from the committee. And we do see that in the public still. Um, so I think that's critical after everything that's happened. There is still support out there for CWMS and there is support for collaboration. Um, so I, I think that's a real key take home. Um, and in terms of how the committee function into the future, I see that as being a pretty much business as usual. Um, we may look to occasionally a bit of committee only time here and there where we need to iron things out, but on the whole, um, see it as a reasonably um, um, yeah, business as usual there. Um, a couple of things we've noticed, that the public appetite for direct engagement is quite low at the moment, um, and that's um, and we're conscious of that, but also there's a couple of things revolving around that. There is a review of how zone committees function going on at the moment. And, and I guess some of the catchment groups and the public are not quite sure exactly what we should have to do to tick the right boxes when some of the legislation becomes active. So, so there's a couple of things here that we're conscious we don't want to get um, lead the public back into direct engagement until we've got some clear um, a clear map for them to follow. Um, so I guess once once we iron out some of those things, then definitely re-engagement with the community is something we'll be doing and getting some on the ground stuff happening. Um, so I guess that brings me a bit of a circle back to your question. Um, how can um, council, and, and when you say council, I definitely think um, ECAN, but also the district councils, and, and with the support of um, our runanga and other government organisations, what we can do to actually help. And, and to me, that's a lot about empowering people and, and the organisations that are involved to get these outcomes. I, I think it's about empowering them. And, and that comes through either having a clear line of advice that people can um, see as having an effect, um, but it also comes about through resources and and being able to not necessarily control them, but certainly to have um, a fair bit of sway on how those resources are allocated in the, in the region. Um, that may be things like, I heard you talking about the, um, the planting um, nursery um, uh, project going on before. I mean, it may be about um, providing gateways for people or catchment groups to buy in bulk through ECAN so that they can get access to um, bulk buys, maybe um, access to resources. It might be about um, um, ch uh, channeling central government money into ground up um, projects. So, but I think resources create power and power, power brings people the rights of the people and the organisation. So I hope that helps, Nan. Thank you, Hamish. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Hamish. That's helpful. So thank you, Hamish. Um, and so we've got a, a question from Councillor Hans, then a question followed Councillor McKenzie. Kia ora, Hamish. Um, Peter's given me a good nudge um, because I was going to make a comment and follow up my question. So I'll just briefly, um, really interested and, and glad to hear from you um, that there's still real community will for collaboration and that uncertainty around the regulatory space with the NPS and with Plan Change 7 and that sort of thing. So I, I'm really 
glad to hear that your community is keen on, on continuing to collaborate. And I just really encourage you to continue to foster that um, because I have concerns about how we how we move forward in this space there too. Um, I guess my question is probably a bit more, bit like Lance, but more specific around how do we continue, how, what are your views about how we continue to collaborate with the community in the wider sector um, as we move into a space that's going to be, um, going to be some even more rocky, rocky roads um, from where I'm sitting about how we, how we set out to make that challenge. Because I think um, I just really like to hear from you because I'm really keen um, that we continue that spirit of collaboration to continue on that progress journey. So he can hear from you what your thoughts are. Uh, thank you. Good question. I, my, my feeling is that whenever we go out and collaborate or talk or engage with the community, um, they effectively they're giving up time, ideas and energy to, to pass on their thoughts through that collaboration. Um, so I think it's critical that what when we engage or, um, or collaborate, um, maybe engagement's the better word, um, it's perceived that the, the messages that come from the ground up are listened to and then it comes back to them in, a, in the form of something they can do something with. Um, and like I say, whether that's money, whether that's um, creating aims or aspirations or goals, but I think there's been a lot of goal setting, a lot of aspirations set out over the last decade and and now we are moving into crunch time where there's some going to be some quite clear targets to hit and, and I think we need to be careful that when we put plans in place to try and meet those targets, they, they are driven by the people who are affected by them. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thanks Hamish. Look, I think that um, we're asking you to speculate on a lot of stuff here, so what we'll do is I think we'll uh, we'll get a comment or a question hopefully from Liz, uh, Elizabeth McKenzie, Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie, and then we'll wrap this up. Okay, mine is actually a comment. I just wanted to thank Hamish um, so much um, for our, especially for our last meeting. It was, I think, quite a pivotal meeting and he did a, a fabulous job in bringing our committee together. And I feel like we're all going forwards now um, with everyone included. Um, so, so thank you, Hamish. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie, appreciate it. So uh, Hamish, we'll wrap this up now. Thank you uh, again, um, and I know you quite well. And thank you for your leadership on this. I know it's, I know you're a pretty busy, uh, young fella, and um, and and sometimes it's tough to do these things. But you're the right person to be doing this at the moment. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you again for Lynn for your continued guidance down there, and and also for Elizabeth in terms of the work that you're uh, getting on and doing there with OTOP. So so thanks, Hamish. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time. We'll release you to do some farm work now. <laughs> it's a bit cold. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, can I just check in on Councillor, oh, sorry, sorry, Councillor um, Bruce Murphy? Uh, and I think he's with Dave Moore and Tamaru. So, Dave, can you hear us? Yep. We're, we're here, wait. We've got um, Peter Bird in the room as well. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, welcome, uh, Bruce, and, and we're in your hands uh, in terms of. Uh, the next uh, 10, 12, 15 minutes, something like that. So, welcome. Cool. Kia ora, everyone. Um, my name is Bruce Murphy. I'm a, a community member who's uh, recently been appointed chairman. I think we've uh, done a couple of meetings and then COVID sort of intervened. So, uh, new to this role, um, just want to acknowledge um, Councillor uh, Nicole Marshall, who's on uh, our committee, does a, a very, very good job. Um, just want to reiterate perhaps the points that Hamish um, made. At the end of the day, collaboration is a huge part of where we've got to in our in our um, plan change area, and I think uh, there's still a willingness uh, in the community and on the ground to be part of that process. So, even though we see essential fresh water sort of coming in on top of this and some hard targets. Um, we're doing everything we can to support the, the process that we're in, in now. Um, a couple of key points, I suppose, for our, um, our district are the, the fact that the Waihau Wainono um, Lagoon and catchment is, is front and centre for us. Um, so we do sort of spend a lot of time discussing that and uh, 
working towards the improvement and um you know just it's such a special place it's at the south end of of of, of Eken, i suppose and in, in some respects but it is a it's a very important place to our community um one of the issues we have there at the moment is the major tributary tributary feeding that uh being the waha river is actually dry so we're trying to work as a community through um what augmentation looks like um we have a fantastic um representation on our group from from iwi and in a, in a really good working relationship um so i'm just make those points and and uh open up if there's any questions please Thanks, Bruce. Um, some questions from councillors. Councillor Marshall. Thanks, uh, Councillor Scott. Uh, Mr Chair, I should say. Uh, Bruce, thank you for, for your comments. And yeah, I just want to reiterate or reflect what, what you've said. Um, I've felt very warmly welcomed to your committee. Um, I had very, very big shoes to fill uh, with Peter stepping away, but uh, I feel very welcomed by your committee and thanks very much to the ECAN team, the wider ECAN team that is involved in the zone as well for all the hard work you do there. Um, similarly made me feel very, very welcome and it's been a privilege. Um, one thing that I'd, I'd just kind of like to echo what Bruce has said around the good iwi relationships there. We've got three runanga in the area, three, three sitting on the zone committee, which I think is probably the highest representation. And the zone committee there really takes seriously and with passion you know, engagement with Runanga, um, especially around rock art. And we had a really good discussion yesterday about silent files and, and you know, the importance of, of meaningful engagement with, with our Runanga and, and doing the right thing. Um, and I yeah, just really want to reflect, you know, that, you know, you can look, look at South Canterbury with a bit of, you know, tongue in cheek, but, you know, you take your relationships very seriously there and I think that's something that we all can learn from and thank you for being such a leader in that regard. Okay, uh, Councillor Farm. Hey, thanks for being here Dave and thanks for your presentation. Um, I guess mine was just a general interest question about the relationship between um, Upper Waitaki and Lower Waitaki and how much um, sort of communication do you have going between the zone committees and do you think that's working well in terms of your relationship? Um, being new to, to the role, I guess um, I only have uh, conversations with, with the chair or, or members up there represented at uh, Waitaki District Council together. Um, I think it's a good operating relationship. Um, two very are diverse and different catchments and different issues around lakes and TLIs and for us more coastal um, downland stream issues. So I think it's a good working relationship but quite separate issues that we face. Usually we have a, 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 a annual bind meeting with Papa just to hear uh, idea. Councillor Sunkel has a question. No, a statement. <laughs> Thank, thanks for that, Bruce. And, and I, I recognise that this conversation does come up at times as to uh, whether we should be co-joined in lower and upper, but I absolutely recognise uh, the difference in the geomorphology, the, the whole thing that, that happens down there. Um, and we do get together on an annual basis and, and have those those conversations. So I'm uh, really pleased to see your, your leadership in the space now. And uh, quite happy that, that we work together where we are, but you have a totally different environment to, to the upper. So thank you for your work and your efforts. I know we're all challenged in the upper end of the lower with, with things that are going on. Um, thanks again. Good, thanks. Um, and Bruce, uh, in terms of a comment, I guess, from me, in terms of where you're at, is, it's always over here. I was just going to tease you about asking a question. Yeah, I'm going to ask a question. I need to leave myself and I need to ease myself into my question. <laughs> I'm just trying to get my words lined up properly. So, so, Bruce, I guess the relationships that you have are reasonably interesting because we've got the three Runanga. You've also got, um, you we also got a relationship with Waitaki District Council. How's that going? How's the, that relationship going? 
Yeah, no, it's good and sound. As I say, we presented to them earlier this week. Um, I guess we are a small part as a, as, a, as a committee of the area, but they are very understanding of what we do and do understand the difference between the collaborative approach that ECAN has taken and perhaps the OIC point of view. So, yeah, no, it's a, it's a good, healthy relationship and we're well represented by uh, Councillor Jim Hopkins. Okay, anyone else got a comment or? Can I, can I, can I? You can carry on, Bruce. Well, just, 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 I guess, a, point, a question that was um, asked and commented on. Hey, can you just turn your button off? Turn your button off. Thank you, thank you. Um, just, just a couple of comments on what the the, the two pre um, pre speakers have said in the way of Ken and Hamish. I guess there is a, a, a frustration around the doing side of it and and, and the challenges that um, lies for us. We have had a zipper out for quite a while now. Um, our committee has worked through a refresh and decided that catchment groups are how we actually get our community to buy into the collaborative process. Um, we are finding it increasingly hard to, uh, in the way of uh, funding for catchment facilitators. So if the question is asked, how can the, uh, how can ECAN actually help us uh, instigate or, or put our plan in place, um, some funding for some facilitators would be absolutely much appreciated. I think that point's well made, and there's a lot of activity in that space at the moment with MPI, and seems to be a lot of money flowing around Bruce and also in that space. So I guess that's a conundrum we've got to put our minds to. Um, is there any other comment from councillors? It doesn't seem to be any other comment, Bruce. So thank you very much for your leadership, and hopefully you will continue into the future as long as Ken Huey has. And and also acknowledging Dave uh, in the work that you do, Dave, and also. Uh, Peter Burt in terms of the role that he uh, has uh, in the Waitaki Valley and I guess if you if you hang on you're going to listen to who sends you all that water because uh, we've got Simon I can see Simon online you can you hear us Simon so thank you Bruce and and we'll we'll pass over to Simon Simon uh, kia ora kia ora um, lovely to uh, to be able to come in on this conversation, I wasn't prepared to make a comment, but um, at the moment, there's, uh, it's sort of likely snowing outside, and I, I expect that um, uh, El Raki will have a, a, a white shroud on her, but ready for uh, celebrating Matariki. But um, so you're definitely going to get some water down there, so you don't need to worry about that one. Um, but yeah, we do at times have meetings together and it has been pretty useful um, over some issues with the dams and, and with the whole Waitaki. So I think that's been pretty helpful for us and we'd like to carry on maybe having one, at least one meeting a year together. Um, but I will get on with the annual report, which you've probably um, perused at some stage um, and really just talk about some of the things that happened in this past year. Uh, through the immediate steps um, biodiversity funding, we've spent quite a bit of money and uh, we've got a lot of projects going with fencing. Um, we've also been looking at Lake Middleton. Uh, we had some concerns around Lake Middleton being a shallow lake beside Lake Oha. And we just really wanted to be able to um, make sure that the pressure that, that people were putting on it um, wasn't going to cause any problems. So, uh, Certainly, we've we've collaborated with Department of Conservation and and some things are happening there. The other um, things, of course, were obviously the native fish um, up Fork Stream and what have you. So that there's some in interesting work being carried out. On the second item, really, was the Ahriri Arm. Um, we had some pretty big concerns this year because, um, like Benmore did spike on its TLI, and it's the first time it's happened. Um, but the good news is that through the monitoring of the whole year, it, it's settled back down again. Um, you know, straight away we look at farming and um, not only that, we had a very wet spring, which means that um, a lot of the wetlands and things would have been flowing into that, that area. So they all have an effect on the TLI. And um, 
but the good good reaction was from the farms that they have actually got together and created a catchment group. Um, there's there's two or three there doing a lot of work around that, um, and there's a lot of recommendations obviously coming through to ECAN. You'll you'll be quite aware of those, um, but I think the the concerns we have from from doing that work is the inequities across the consent process. Um, a third of the far farms that are in uh, consent, consent with consents um, are pretty much at, they have to keep their farms under 2.75 TLI in the lake. So um, that's quite hard for those third, or it's about 10 of them. Uh, there's another third which ha have, to have to be under 2.9, and the rest don't need to do anything. So we're rather, we're rather good if we could get all of those people on the same page so that it's a bit like having three speed limits and it's not ideal. So that's something that could be certainly looked at at your level. I think that's really important. Um, the sad part is those, those 10 farmers, uh, they look to mitigate things and uh, re really uh, right across the board. But the, then you've got another another third of the farmers who uh, don't have to worry about it until it triggers at 2.9 and then you've got another third that probably haven't got a clue what's going on. So. <laughs> That's the concern we have. And so it'd be nice just to have a one set of rules for everyone. Um, I know it's difficult. Some of those gone through very expensive processes of getting their consents and won't like changes. Um, but it's it's really getting around the table and finding some way through that. I, I think it's really, really important. Um, the other uh, issue that will fit, not an issue really, it's, it, well, it is, has been an issue. Is, is the tourism is having um, a big effect on our area. And part of our project was to start up this Love, Love Your Lakes. And uh, Kate and some of your staff have just done a wonderful job of actually getting some very good uh, posters up through the, the region and trying to clean up uh, some of the things that are going on, certainly with tourism. I guess with COVID-19, that's going to change quite dramatically. And, and I, I certainly... Uh, would like to report a wee bit on some of the businesses up here at a later, later stage, but um, I would imagine it gives an opportunity for the district councils, um, ECAN and everybody to get together and think their way through um, that whole uh, freedom camping um, tourism issue going into the future because there's a tremendous pressure on our lakes and, uh, and we are very concerned that um, you know, that, that there would be a problem down the track from that. And I think it's probably given us time to think it through. Um, on the on the negative side of COVID-19, the local businesses are under extreme pressure and you'll be quite aware of that. So if any of you think of ha having a holiday, you're probably going to get some pretty good deals up around here. So uh, I'll leave you with that and it's nearly lunchtime. So thank you for the, for the opportunity of, uh, of, of speaking to you. Simon, before there is comment or questions, from, or questions hopefully from other councillors, I'd just like to say, look, that work that you're doing on TLI and um, it's self-instigated almost by the farmers up there. And I'm sure Councillor Sunk will have something to say about this. So well done for that. And and I also think that proactive work that you're doing in the communities on uh, tourism and, and the Lake Middleton work has is, is been well well seen. So thank you very much for that, your leadership in that space, and hope, hopefully that you will stay on uh, for a while yet. Simon. So, any questions? So, Councillor Sunkel. Just uh, thank you very much, Simon, for, for your leadership uh, within uh, this uh, this patch, uh, very special patch. And uh, we do have those issues of TLI um, on Ben Moore. We have uh, around the rowing a whole bunch of things that that are confronting us in that space and with a very limited number of people who then probably give effect to, to achieving the outcomes. Can I just uh, reassure you in my conversations with staff, uh, with uh, Nadine and others, that we're well aware of trying to get that alignment into place, and, and it is one of the challenge. I'm also aware of the challenges within the community uh, where, where individuals and groups are. Uh, whilst we have the catchment group together, there's some challenges between different groups and a wee bit of fingers being marginally pointed. So, again, as, as a council, on the staff well aware of those issues trying to achieve it and then finally uh, I will be an apology for the meeting tomorrow as a soft northerner I'm not too sure I want to drive south into a snowstorm at uh, six o'clock tonight so my apologies.
<laughs> Apologies. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. <laughs> Great question. Um, Council Farm. <laughs> hey, thank you, Simon. Um, and I just want to note that, you know, we've noted your various serious issues around COVID and the tourism challenges there. So I, I, I guess my question is more like a curiosity. So I didn't want to take away from your very um, well made points. But um, my question was around the uh, big nose and long jaw um, fork stream site near Tikapoth. And um, it was really about uh, the method that you're using or that the groups are using to get rid of the trout and move them downstream. And it says they carefully net the trout. Um, but do they electric fish? Um, it, it, yes, they have actually used uh, electric fishing in the past, but I, I think that the, that's been part of it. I, I'm pretty sure of that. I haven't been um, actually there seeing it going on, but I think John would probably tell you more about this. All right. Uh, well, from you, yeah. Thank you, Simon. But I was also just curious about the New Zealand Defence Forces um, input. Where did, how does that come into it? Well, it, the the actual fork stream runs through, um, right through the Defence Force area. So they have actually come on board with that and they've been pretty helpful. Um, obviously, um, they've been collaborating with them. It's not a very good place to walk through if they're actually doing exercises, but <laughs> however, <laughs> it's, it's working pretty well. And I think it, it's an ideal stream because um, it's not really been a great uh, trout fishing stream in the past, really. Um, I'm not quite sure whether it was probably the the canal that goes, the, sorry, the uh, culvert that goes under the canal may have stopped the trout from actually spawning in that area now because it's quite dark. And and um, so I don't think it was a big, a, as big a job as I thought it was going to be. So it's quite a nicely protected area now. So it's, um, it's organised. I've lost. Thank you, Simon. Phil Clearwater here, Simon. My question's around the immediate sets funding projects that your zone committee um, developed. And I'm particularly interested in the fencing partnerships with some of the, that was one of the big Glenmore station. I'm just really interested to know how that worked for um, large runs uh, in terms of streams, especially when they become quite small waterways, how, what the view of some of the landowners might be to develop that project. That's a very good question because I think Certainly, um, with the Department of Conservation being in control of most of those wetland areas, um, it have had a head of Alexandrina and there's many others in this area. Um, I do believe that the, the priorities are always um, highlighted. So those are the areas you would go into first to protect those highly pristine areas. The Anywhere there's extensive grazing, uh, um, it's, it's quite different from intensive. So for areas that are fenced up into small areas, um, that's priority stuff. And a lot of farmers are spending a lot of money to, to fence off those areas. Um, again, from a consent process, it's, it's quite difficult for the fact that um, in some cases, that's the only access to water. So uh, in some, that will be something that farmers really have to look quite closely at having some maybe some water races or finding some other ways of actually bringing troughs or something down into the areas um, that they fence off. So, it, you know, it's, it, it's, it's extensive some of it and I don't think um, some of that gorge run stuff would be really practical to fence anyway because the first flood came down would take the fence out. But it, it, it's an issue that's got everybody a little bit concerned because there's a bit of a grey area there. Um, I think if you've got um, an, an intensive gra and grazing, there's no doubt that it, nobody's got any doubt about that. Everybody likes to be getting in on fencing and people are doing that. But um, it's more in the, of the extensive areas that people have got um, yeah, some real concerns around that from a farming point of view, because the finger can be pointed at you, but uh, it's just not really practical. And there'd be hundreds of kilometres of fences uh, that would like to be taken out for the first flood. Thank you, Simon. Look, we'll take Vicky, uh, Council of South West's question, and then I think we'll wrap up. Thanks. Um, kia ora. Thank you for your presentation. I'm interested in the hui that you held on traditional Māori names. It's something that's been discussed in the public or has been in the papers in the last six months in the Banks Peninsula area of Christ, or part of the Christchurch area. Um, I just wonder how was that received and also was it open to anyone in the public who wanted to come along or was it a particular group of people? Thank you. What, what, 
<laughs> our meetings are always open to the public to come along, and, and sadly, you know, we don't get too many um, there. But it, well, that was a fabulous um, presentation, and, and especially being aerial, coming right down from Mataraki all the way down the Waitaki, um, and learning the names. I think it, it, that's it's tremendously helpful. But also, I'd like to see it um, really a lot of more of that information come into the public arena because it actually tells you a story about the early people coming through here and. I think the old people knew when to cross the river, and a lot of those names were really relevant. The fact that it was slack pools where you probably safely cross the river, and other places like that. So, and shelter spots, and 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 it was extremely interesting. We 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 did enjoy it, and um, it was all over too soon. So, um, all I can say is I hope the local Ruanga get right behind trying to promote us as much as possible. Thank you. There's one more. There's one more, um, and I'll get shot if I don't let him. Okay, Simon. Uh, just going back to that question around fencing, Simon. You uh, pres presumably, uh, could you comment uh, in extensive grazing systems if uh, stock were required to get all that water out of troughs, then that in itself could cause environmental issues, presumably on that concentration of stock, whereas otherwise they would be spread out of large areas. That's good. That's point. good point. I think. They, uh, yeah. The opportunity, opportunity for, for getting feedback on this. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> that's better. Um, there's an opportunity for you know anybody who's going into irrigation or developing upland or, or, or fencing it down. There's no question about that. Everybody wants to put in uh, troughs and 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 protect the waterways. But there are extensive areas that just wouldn't be practical. And I'm talking, you know, some blocks that are sort of four thousand hectares, and you've got um, Maybe 150 cattle running around. So um, the effects of them would be minor. In fact, there'd probably be um, more effects from the trampers going in there, to be quite honest. But it's just it's just common sense stuff. But it's sometimes hard to regulate because you've got to actually look at it from a, a sensible point of view. Um, but the public might see, you know, a couple of old cows walking through, say, the Dobson River or something or other, and there's something like. Um, I think there's uh, about 20 kilometres of river, um, but you know it, it, that that's the that's the danger we have. Of course, it, it can get blown out of a proportion, and uh, and some of those areas are very very um, sparsely grazed. Simon, thank you very much. And again, <clears throat> said it to everybody in terms of their chairmanship, but uh, having someone with your knowledge of the Mackenzie and the uh, is is invaluable to us uh, in terms of that zone committee. I know when I come up there. Then you've got to at least gone to five meetings before they even let you talk. So you know you're very passionate about your area, and very uh, very good in terms of the service that you're giving to us. And, and again, um, uh, ho hopefully you will continue into the future. With that, I think we'll wrap up the session. We're now going to have a break until uh, one o'clock uh, when we come back. I hope you've got a nice lunch. We've got some recommendations. Oh yes, have we got some recommendations here? Yeah. Yeah. Can you, would you like to put those? Page 96. Okay. Yeah, so the recommendations on page 96, uh, there's four of them that we received the four reports. So we've got and moved by Councillor Mackay, seconded by Councillor Marshall. All those in favour? All those against? Carried. Again, thank you to Chairs. We'll see you back at mid uh, one o'clock. We are adjourning. So yes. formal adjournments until one of. I think we're all in the room now in terms of this session, and we've got some people online. I see Kelly there. Can you hear Kelly? Yes, sorry. <laughs> cool. So we're up to item 9.2, which is uh, the adoption of the annual plan. And in your minutes, it's pages 114 to 118 plus attachments which are these attachments here uh, which have been circulated circulated uh, separately 
which is the liability investment policy and um, the annual plan itself. So everyone's familiar with those. Um, so the recommendations on page um, 112 to 115, I suggest that we take recommendation one to six in, in the first tranche of those, rec tranche of those recommendations. Uh, and, um, and then we shall take uh, recommendation seven on its own and then recommendation eight. Would someone like to move? Uh... I shall move, Mr Chairman, and speak to it if I could. Thank you. So yeah, thank, thank you, Mr Chairman. It is uh, that uh, an exciting time where the culmination of the uh, last few months of, of work has brought us to the point where today we adopt the annual plan and, and strike the rate. So the paper that we have before us uh, now is uh, the adoption of the annual plan. And as the chairman has outlined, we are going to, uh, when we get to it, look at uh, items one to six and then look at item seven, which I think will be the opportunity for those who uh, may wish to speak uh, for and against to do so. <clears throat> and then the, the, the simple uh, eighth item that is there. Before we get there, a wee bit of history. Um, our long-term plan suggested that we would be looking at a, uh, a rate of 5.5%. Uh, over time, uh, issues have arise or arisen uh, around uh, public transport reserves and the like, which saw us reach a position and go out to the community, not in consultation, but, but in conversation around uh, a figure of 9.8%, which again, there was some uh, some some tension in that conversation, uh, but that is what we went to the community with. From there, as we're all aware, we have had <coughs> COVID visited upon us. And through that uh, period of time, a, a number of things have happened. Uh, we have reduced our expenditure because of <coughs> our inability to put uh, actions and implementation in place. We've had the opportunity to look at our reserves policy and reassess them and a number of other matters as indicated in the paper. And given the, the tensions, uh, economic and psychological within the community due to COVID, we instructed staff to go out and see uh, how far they could peer the, uh, the rate increase back. And they came back to us <clears throat> with a uh, figure, basically the government inflation number of 2.3%. Again, a conversation uh, between council and councillors and a final recommendation accepted by majority at the time of a figure of 4% being a rate rise, uh, which included some additions for uh, the coastal plan, climate change, um, public transport within Christchurch, which is targeted, and, and our, our tree planting programme. So we have, over time, had an opportunity to debate uh, there is some tension. There are still issues that sit there, but the majority of this council has reached a point of 4%, which is uh, the plan that we have sitting before us today. Uh, there will be an opportunity, as I state, under item 7 for those that may wish to uh, restate some of their views to do so, and uh, then we will move through the rest of the process. So whilst... Um, I might personally be, be unhappy that we're at where we are. Uh, we all have a differing view. I uh, therefore move uh, the first six uh, recommendations on page 114 of the agenda and seek a seconder. I'm happy to second, John. So thank you very much, uh, Councillor Sunkel, for that introduction to these items, one to six. And I'll take them as read. Uh, no one wants any clarification of those that have been before us before. I think we've been through these enough in terms of where we're at with that. So I'm just happy enough to put this to the vote. Uh, all those in favour of one to six, please say aye. Aye. Those against, carried. So we now come to item seven. Thank you, Mr. Seven, the chairman. Mr. Seven, yes. <laughs> so you, you can well, we go there. <clears throat> Um, item number seven uh, adopts the Canterbury Regional Council's annual plan 2020 21 in the form attached to this resolution at uh, attachment two. So I will move that, seek a seconder. 
and Councillor Clearwater, and again open the floor conversation through you, Mr. Chair. So thank you, uh, thank you, Councillor Sankle, for that. Um, and now this is an opportunity for people to talk to this item, uh, and so uh, if we do a, 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 a an orderly walk through this, who would like to go first? Councillor Marshall. Kia ora, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, I'd like to echo uh, and just support what John has said in terms of, oh, sorry, Councillor Sankul has said in terms of walking us through the process to date um, and the really robust conversation we've had around this. And, and just thank, thank staff for the efforts that have gone into getting to where we are today. It's been a huge and challenging effort by many externalities and internalities. And I really want to thank everyone who has been involved in getting us to today for really rising to the challenges that have been presented to you both from the council and the wider um, happenings. Um, and yeah, it's just fantastic. And thank, thanks everyone so, so much. Um, I'm really thankful for this 4% raised for a couple of reasons. First one is the, the guarantees we've put around the public transport service provisions, uh, specifically for myself and my constituency, the express services from the Waimakariri commencing next year is a huge mitigation on potential um, so uh, social issues that are going to come with increased cars through their communities. And I'm really thankful that we're offering that mitigation. Um, I'm really happy that we've managed to continue the same service delivery that was proposed in the initial draft annual plan, but that we're funding everything that we're not rating through our own reserves. And I think that's a really prudent measure and I'm thankful that we can continue to meet our levels of service um, without placing undue harm on the community. I'm thankful that our council has endorsed um, greater action around the coastal plan. This is long overdue and a very welcome step in the right direction for offering greater protections and more uh, in a more up-to-date space. Um, and I'm really excited to see what's going to come, how, you know, from what we can deliver from this plan and moving through to our long-term plan. I think it's been a really great process of all of us working together um, across positions and at all over the place, really, um, and I'm I'm really thankful for where we are today. Now we have uh, Councillor Farm and then uh, Councillor Mackay, then Councillor Southworth. Thank you, Chair. I'm feeling really positive about where we've got to um, with recommendations today, um, similar to Councillor Marshall. Um, and as I've reflected previously, I really believe the role is. Um, that we have as councillors of ECAN is not simply to make the best decisions for today, but for the future. And in this climate and ecological emergency, I think that's a real, really heightened obligation to keep the pre pre preparations for the future and the needs of younger and future generations in mind. So in short, I really think this annual plan is a solid basis in which we've not only greatly reduced our proposed rate rise, but we've prioritised three key areas of expenditure which are really critical to us, listening to our communities, responding to our long-term challenges and getting on with building a resilient region. Um, just really briefly putting on my biodiversity, biosecurity lead hat, I'm particularly thrilled that the emphasis on biodiversity as a strategic priority continues as part of this annual plan um, in recognition of the urgent and ongoing challenges we face with continued biodiversity loss, pest incursions and a changing climate. Our biodiversity projects have not only remained intact despite our COVID challenges, but our proposed funding for a comprehensive coastal plan in Miurudaku in particular will have direct benefits to biodiversity both on land and in, in our freshwater um, estuarine and marine environment. So echoing other councillors um, with a huge thank you to staff across the board in this particularly challenging task of getting us to this point, and I'll be supporting the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Farm. Now we've got Councillor Mackay, Councillor Southworth and Councillor Edge. Thank you, Chair. Look, I, I do want to um, support the comments of Councillor Marshall and um, with respect to the huge amount of work that the staff have done on getting um, the plan to this stage. And um, particularly Catherine, oh, Catherine and your team 
um, for the effort that you've put in there. When um, we went out with the proposed 9.8% uh, uh, rate rise for consultation, and the staff came back with a CPI and then added back into the transport, um, public transport uh, funding. So I was very comfortable to, to sit with those two options um, rather than the 4%. I, I'm very happy that we can actually deliver the levels of service that we agreed and all the work that we actually had, but I'm very uncomfortable with the fact that we're going out with a, um, a rate rise at 4%. I am also very uncomfortable that we have actually added the three extra projects in and tagged them uh, with funding when I think that we should have actually uh, maintained a option of actually how we actually might fund those uh, with a bit more information around what they uh, would do and when they would actually, uh, that, that funding would actually be needed. I would have liked to have seen us um, use, well, we are using the uh, reserves um, in, in in our rate pass funding point sheet, um, pool, but also we do have a very strong balance sheet here and it was just around the opportunity of using that rather than taking hard earned cash from our rate payers at this time post-COVID particularly, of great uncertainty economically and job-wise for, for many of them. So um, I think just from a perspective of my constituency, particularly the Rangiora and Kaiapo urban um, population, who had supported um, the express bus services earlier on and then were somewhat surprised with the figure that came out, um, I do think that they should take some comfort the fact that it's been reduced, albeit um, more from a logistical point of view and that it's a six month uh, time frame rather than a year. So we'll have to see where we get with that um, in a long term plan. But look, I just, um, am, I'm not going to be able to support the actual figure, the rate increase, but I do support the, the work programs that are actually in the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kainer, Councillor Southworth, and then Councillor Leach. Okay. Well, thank, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Tanakoto Kato, um, I'm the co lead of the Climate Change Hazards Risk and Resilience Portfolio, and that plays into my perspective, and I will give my reasons now as to why I've landed with supporting the 4% rise. I want to acknowledge that we have had to significantly adjust the rates in light of the economic impacts of COVID-19. And I also draw attention to the fact that we continue to face the twin crises of climate change and ecological degradation. And these aren't distant threats, but they're here now. I've considered all of these issues in determining my position. I'm supporting the overall rate rise of 4%, and the council, I believe, has mechanisms in place to protect those who do find themselves in significant financial difficulties. There's a rates rebate scheme and there's a rate payment holiday um, for those that need them. 2.3% of our proposed 4% was inflationary, and in conjunction with drawing on reserves and carrying it over from the previous financial year, we've been able to continue our levels of service, and that's great news. And on top of that, we were also able to um, hold off raising bus fares, which is also very good news. Um, the submitters on our draft annual plan, however, made it very clear that we need further progress addressed to address the threats of climate change and the loss of our precious ecosystems. I think our constituents expect to see Environment Canterbury taking a lead in those areas, and that's what we're doing. And all of the components that I support on top of the 2.3 inflationary rise are linked to those climate change and biodiversity actions. We can't legally mitigate against greenhouse, against greenhouse emissions in our plans or consents, but we can improve our public transport, and that's what the 0.8% rise that we've agreed to um, can, can do. <coughs> provides a viable choice for more people by giving more frequent buses and more express services for our towns and suburbs. Our coastline is our front line in the face of rising sea level and our, our coastal environment plan is well overdue for an overhaul. The bulk of it was written in 2005, so I support an additional 0.5% rate rise to enable a comprehensive review of that plan to incorporate the latest scientific data and also integrate Naitahu values. The issues of sea level rise, coastal erosion, coastal water quality and protection of indigenous marine wildlife are among the issues that will be addressed in that plan. Environment Canterbury also has the responsibility to ensure that our communities 
understand the risks that climate change brings. And we need to work closely with those communities to develop adaptation plans. The choices that we make now, importantly, avoid passing unnecessary costs onto future inhabitants. And so 0.15% enables us to begin that all important climate change engagement. And finally, our draft annual plan signaled a desire to create a region-wide native planting and biodiversity enhancement project, which we've called Meurururako. There was significant support in our annual plan submissions for this, for, for enhancing biodiversity, and I therefore support the 0.25% rise for that project. And in total, that makes up the 4%. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Southworth. Now, Councillor Edge. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, firstly, I want to thank um, all members of the community who um, provided feedback on, on our draft uh, annual plan, and especially to those who um, took the time to attend our virtual meetings, uh, and it was very much appreciated by all Council. Um, and of course, our 9.8% original uh, draft proposal uh, had to be changed in the light of COVID-19, um, and we've responded with that. Uh, council staff, um, I want to commend them for providing a range of options to us to consider, and we deliberated, um, and we resolved in the end to to uh, provide that recommendation of four percent. And and we also within that four percent, um, it included obviously the CPI um, base of two point three, and then another one point seven percent to specifically uh, target four things, uh, public transport, uh, a coastal environment plan, the uh, climate change engagement and the tree planting project. And and it's come about um, because of exceptionally good management by staff. And they've advised us that there is no expected impact on the levels of service provision that was originally set out in the 2018-2028 um, long-term plan. So that's just uh, outstanding, really. Um, and although the allowance for reserves um, and the build-up of cash reserves and river schemes has been deleted, um, because of this healthy financial position that we're in, we do have the ability to borrow at very low interest rates, should their need arise um, if there's a significant um, natural hazard event, for example. Um, amendments to the Council's Treasury policy are being planned, um, and that's going to enable some future borrowings to deal with COVID-19 responses, recovery and cash flow management purposes. And that means going forward, we do have a high level of flexibility to access funds. As a regional council, we do have a responsibility to ensure intergenerational equity and meet long-term planning goals for the benefits of the environment and for our people. And therefore, in my judgment, um, we do need to maintain levels of service, and that's fantastic. And we have allowed for some additional uh, really important improvements that we've identified specifically. Getting underway with the long overdue review of the Coastal Environment Plan is essential, and beginning conversations with our community about the anticipated effects of climate change is paramount. So I'm supportive of the 4% rates rise and the adoption of the annual plan that delivers outcomes that our community um, have really supported. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Mr Chairman. And following your strict orders not to read my uh, read a speech to you, and uh, and I have the advantage that I can't read my own writing anyway, so <laughs> I will have to sort of speak off the cuff. Um, I want to speak against the motion. Um, I think, uh, as Councillor Mackay and other councillors have done, thank Miles and Catherine and their teams for coming back to this council with a, uh, the option of a 2.3 rate rise, which not only delivered our um, the, the continued level of service on our priorities of water management and biodiversity, uh, but it also reflected the uh, difficult circumstances we, we find ourselves in. So I am um, uh, upset that we're not taking that particular option. Uh, and when I listen to all the reasons for the 4% rate rise, I have to say I can't help but be cynical to think that some of those projects were, were uh, put forward 
to justify the full, the difference between the 2.3 and 4 percent rate rise. Uh, so in light of this, you know, the financial stress that our communities and uh, the stress and uncertainty that our communities are facing, I personally think this is a poor decision and one I don't support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. And now, Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, I'd like to <coughs> support um, the annual plan and the rates rise um, and also thank the staff for all their work um, on the annual plan and for the people who gave um, feedback on the annual plan. Um, I think that the 4% rates rise strikes the right balance um, for us um, in terms of mitigating against the pandemic, um, but also making sure that we're not putting ourselves in a risky position for the future. Um, I think having actually ring fencing funding for the coastal plan um, for climate change engagement and for planting trees is the right thing to do um, to make sure that these projects um, will definitely go ahead. Um, I also note that this, that staff actually did recommend 4% um, rates rise. Um, and I also think it's important that we remember that uh, what we're doing now, um, is we have to think about the future generations um, and be in a good position to actually protect them as well as the people now. So, um, yeah, that's my view. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Councillor Pauling. Right, Kia ora, Tātou. Uh, first of all, just want to acknowledge John for introducing um, the paper today and uh, the way you gave a background to how we got here. So I just want to say thanks, John. Um, and I want to acknowledge the, um, the people that are, you know, the councillors around the room that are um, not supporting the motion uh, and understand, respect their their views. Um, I just, just want to uh, put my support to the to the recommendation. Um, I think that the what well, it's not things that we thought up out of thin air. They're things that we heard from our community um, during the feedback that we went out um, over the last few months. And of course, uh, as Elizabeth uh, Councillor McKenzie has just said. Um, things that our staff also recommended to us. So, um, yeah, I'm really supportive of uh, where we're going and I look forward actually to um, doing more of this in our long term plan coming up. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pauling. Is there any other councillors? Councillor Haynes. Yeah, okay. Kia ora uh, Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, Peter. And I'm, I'm glad to um, have this process where we're all able to, to state our views um, as we make this important decision. Um, like others, I'd like to thank staff for all the effort they've put into this. Um, I know that putting together an annual plan is no mean feat, particularly when you've got new councillors um, and new councillors that, that are asking lots of questions and wanting lots of additional things put in here and there and, and, and really trying to understand as, and learn as we go to. Um, as I said on the day of the deliberations last time, um, with a fully elected council comes a renewed requirement for public accountability uh, on our rates and our expenditure. Um, this is a heightened no more now than we consider the options before us um, as as our economic economic reali reality is setting in. Um, I'd like to try to talk all the comments made by Councillor Mackay and Councillor McKenzie around the discomfort they've expressed with what's before us today in terms of the annual plan and are we voting in the same manner. Um, I do wish to keep the rates rise on our community as low as practically possible and in line with the level of service that we outlined in our engagement document. Um, our rates rise could have could have been 2.3% and with the addition of the public transport improvements could have been 3.1%. Um, and still have delivered the levels of service that we'd previously committed to the community. Um, and as I said on the day of those deliberations last month, um, adding additional expenditure, in my view, over and above what we what we took to the community for engagement and what was originally outlined, um, because we've managed to achieve the option of much lower rates increase than originally anticipated and the engagement constitutes adding in of additional projects. It constitutes, um, it constitutes in my view, um, a, a little bit of opportunism around putting those things in because we have the opportunity because we've managed to get get the rates rise lower. Um, these additional projects, I've no doubt, have merit, and I, I just would have felt that they would be 
better off being considered more fully and allow for more development um, in, a, in a better process for a more sustainable approach to the way in which we funded them and how we could have them more ongoing if, if we'd done that through the LTP process, um, as I would have anticipated. Um, for now, as we to see the full implications of, of the COVID lockdown on our community fabric, on our businesses, on our households, on our families, at this time of economic crisis, ratepayer money is better off in, in ratepayers' hands. It's better off in their pockets than it is in ours. Uh, and, and particularly when we have the options, as others have said, of borrowing at much lower rates. Um, every single dollar counts for our ratepayers when they're facing financial uncertainty, when they're trying to decide which things not to put in the supermarket trolley, which bills not to pay this this week, and, and when they're considering what their future is when they've lost their jobs or their businesses. Um, so I can't support this today. Um, regardless of, of, the, of the merit there may be behind some of these projects. Thank you. We have Councillor Clearwater and then we'll have Councillor Apanui and then John can wrap this up before we vote. Councillors, you'll be aware that earlier this morning we heard quite clear comment from the chairs of the zone committees that to engage local people and, and involve them in zone committee type activities, the best way was to listen to what those people were saying. And I put it to you, we went out in February saying we wanted to deliver your vision for a better future. And I'm quite sure, councillors, that in passing this annual plan report, we will actually be able to assist the delivery of that. We'll be doing our part. And the 4% increase, it certainly, I think, allows um, council to respond um, to, to the outcomes which we have, have art, we desire um, and we really need as a council, as against um, the different financial challenges, particularly following COVID-19. And I think overall it is a good and fair balance. And those initiatives, like the Coastal Plan Review and the Regional Planting, Mayuru Rakao, and Climate Change engage, Engagement, in fact, they totally follow the draft strategic directions, which I am sure we will be signing off soon. I want to, in relation to restore the restoration of the public transport funding, I want to say that that option in the CPI level, the 2.3% uh, of an increase, that actually would only cover the basic requirements to run our transport as we currently do. And actually, that is pretty close to that sort of slogan that some people, and I'm not saying at this table, we're demanding zero rates increase. It actually ends up having a, would have ended up having a similar impact on our public transport. So it would be similar in terms of any, um, of, of any uh, improvement in our public transport service and certainly zero um, improvement in investing in our public transport, which we know we need to do. I also put it to council that as a regional council, besides the accountability part, we also have a responsibility to play our part in our region. When it comes to the regional public transport plan passed by the previous council, we want to now play out our part. So I'm not actually prepared to say, well, the last council agreed to that, but we're too afraid to be bold and actually do it. Actually, I've got no doubt that for a better future, we have to be transformative as a council. Um, and certainly, I'm, we're well aware that many ratepayers currently with COVID-19 will struggle. And we learned yesterday, particularly around the Rates Rebate Act, there is very good opportunity for our TAs to uh, re put in that rebate, to remit, to remit some of the rates, and in effect have a subsidy for any ratepayers who are on low incomes. So our regional council has to continue to drive transport as part of our PT, public transport futures too. And um, to help our greater, the whole Greater Christchurch achieve mode shift, for example, we have to make sure that the, the draft strategic directions, which are here, and one of the key ones is that we would champion safe multi multimodal transport, transport choices. And so to achieve that, like, for example, to reduce carbon emissions and to address climate change, we can't just stop at declaring a, a climate change of emergency as a council. We can now start to address those issues with all of the initiatives that the 4% rates increase will achieve. And I certainly want to thank staff for exemplary work around all of the information that we asked you for 
and the way you provided that. And I apologise if I was over demanding and asking for that. And certainly the submitters and the people who may comment on it on the annual plan. So, councillors, this is our, our first annual plan as a council, and I'm sure it does actually signal transformation. And I, I say let's deliver um, the vision of the people of Canterbury for a better future. Thank you, Councillor Clearwater. Councillor Apanui. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I'd love to deliver a speech with that much passion. Um, thank you for that, Phil. Look, we were staring down the barrel of a 9.8% increase. So I think to get to 4% certainly is a, is a good testament to our staff um, and the, the magic they can do with, with numbers. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge John for, for putting this together for us. Um, you know, he's played a, a huge part in, in this. <clears throat> when, when I look at what we've put back in on top of the 2.3, the public transport is certainly important. It will get us to a point where we function more efficiently faster, and therefore it will, it will make that recovery you know, equally as fast. And it will take the burden off our, our ratepayers and people in the this, in this city and the region. So what I see happening, if we didn't do that, we'd, we'd suffer from social hypothermia, which is where we just get everything in to protect the city, and the region will suffer. So if we make the heart more accessible and we can release things out to the region, that just everything becomes more efficient and we can recover faster. And then I look at the other things in there and to, I suppose, justify it uh, to myself, the environment will not wait. It doesn't wait for us until the right time to take care of it. Um, there's never a right time to have a have a child, but people may do when they come along. Um, I just don't think the environment is, is going to wait. So for 4%, which I still consider a win, I think we're doing the right thing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Apanui. And I will go to John and then back to myself, John, and we will vote on it. So to you, you can sum up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I thank you all for your contribution in, in the debate today. It, uh, uh, everyone's sort of uh, re-exercised their, their views and values, and I guess for me, somewhat anonymous, so that I, uh, I proposed the motion whilst uh, probably not supporting it 100%, given that I led the, the amendment to try and attempt to bring the rate rise back to 3.1%. So I'm still sitting here conflicted, deciding whether I vote for, abstain, or against, uh, given just, just where I sit, but I, I thank everyone for their contribution. Um, I believe there were probably other mechanisms or avenues to, to fund that other million dollars that we, we might have done. And so I guess I, I stick to that um, as I come to my conclusion and represent the, the views and values that have been represented to me by, by my community. But I, again, I thank everyone for their contribution and the manner in which this debate has been held today and pass back to the chairman. Thank you very much. And look, I've got a few comments here. And look, thank everybody for the honesty. It's really good to have it and to have your views. Um, you know, no one threw anything. No one got upset. <laughs> no one tore their hair out that I can see anyway. So thanks for that. It's uh, really valuable to know that uh, when we claim that we're in the first democratic council for 10 years, it's good to know that we can operate like that. Look, I've asked uh, Louise if uh, when we put this vote that we do, do take a division on this because I think people want their names recorded, so that will happen. Uh, so that might be uh, take a bit of time. Um, and, and I just want to acknowledge uh, a comment also that Council Edge made regarding the public public submission process got us to where we are today. So thank the public and the submitters that went out of their way to represent uh, themselves to us on their views uh, in a pretty difficult um, time. And, and, you know, it wasn't as free flowing as what it would have been if we could have had it in here and done it face to face. But it, it seems it seemed to work. Um, in terms of my position on this, um, uh, I've thought about this, but I will reflect the position that our chair took. I'm sitting in her chair, so um, it, it's it's probably counterintuitive that I do that. But I fear that I feel that that is the only thing I can do. Uh, and the fact that uh, you know two days ago I wasn't going to be sitting here, so so having said those things, uh, Louise, uh, we shall put the motion. Motion, which is motion, which is number seven, and we don't need to re uh, restate it. It's been moved and seconded. So, 
Could I ask for those who are in favour of the motion to, put, to raise their hands so Louise can uh, can um, can record? Sorry, are we doing a show of hands or the vision? Well, a a, the, well what, technically, okay. see, I don't know. No, sorry. So, Mr Chair, what we do first is we take a vote on voices okay, let's, and then we call for division. Okay. So all those in favour say aye. Aye. All those against say nay. No. Call for a division. So I'll call for a division. Do they raise their hands or we just... No, I reckon no. Um, just, just to explain, councillors, for divisions, um, back in March 2004, actually, the, that council resolved that we'll have a random order. So we have a random order of who I call out. So I've got four against or abstained. So you've got three. And we are voting on adopt the Canterbury Regional Council's annual plan 2020-2021 in the form attached to this resolution as attachment two. So, first, Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie. Uh, Councillor Nicole Marshall. Uh, Councillor Megan Hands. Yes. Sorry, Louise, do you want to repeat what you hear back just for... Uh, Councillor John Sunkel. Abstain. Councillor Lam Farm. Councillor Afanui. Councillor Vicky Southworth. Councillor Claire Mackay. Councillor Ian McKenzie. Councillor Craig Pauling. Councillor Claire, Phil Clearwater. Councillor Grant Edge. Deputy Chair Peter Scott. So I declare it's nine four, three against and one abstain. So thank you. Um, and that will be recorded in the minutes. The names will be recorded in the minutes. Sorry, I just took Louise's light off of there, but that will be recorded in the minutes that way. So thank you very much for that. Um, uh, first time I've been involved in one of those, so uh, first time for everything. So thank you very much. Thank you, councillors. Thank you. So thank you very much for that. Now we move on to item 9.3. Sorry, uh, yes. one more. We have uh, item 8, oh. the recommendation, uh, the procedural recommendation that we uh, delegate to the chief executive, chief executive of the authority to make alterations of minor effect or correct any minor errors. So I will so move. Councillor Farm second. Councillor Farm second that. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Carried. All those against? Carried. So now, John, can we go to 9.3? So 9.3 is on pages 122 to 146, and it's setting the rates, and it's going to be introduced by Councillor Sunkel. The recommendation will give you some time to get there. Page one, two, 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 two yeah. pages, so four nine, I'm getting, getting confused. You're all right. Just Another point on this one. Catch your breath. This is, this is yeah, setting the rates in 9.3. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, having now uh, adopted the annual plan, this again basically becomes uh, somewhat procedural, although we, we have had a request to debate uh, item or recommendation for. So I, I won't rule, read out the, all, all the, uh, the recommendations, um, but we do have recommendations one, uh, which resolves under the section yeah. 53 <clears throat> one of local government act. Uh, the resolution to collect on behalf of council uh, two delegates the authority pursuant to the local government rating act 2002 to the chief executive financial director and, and others uh, to apply penalties and uh, approve application for fees postponements rates remissions and the like and the third one resolves to approve the delegations of the director of financial corporate services to sign rating collection and dvd agreements with environment county authorities and the like so procedural i will uh, ask someone please move that we uh, move those first three items so uh, moved by uh, councillor marshall and seconded by councillor apanui 
So is there any conversation around those three items? There isn't, so I'll put those, all those in favour. That say aye, all those against say no, carry. Uh, the fourth item. Button. Uh, the fourth item in this paper, uh, number four, resolves the setting of the rates for the 2020-21 financial year and sets the following rates, including GST, pursuant to the Local Government Rating Act 2002. And A, states due dates for payment in accordance with section 24, and B, applies penalties on unpaid rates in accordance with section 57 and 58 on rating units in the region for the financial year commencing 1st July 2020, ending 30th June 2021. Uh, these rates are set in accordance with Canterbury Regional Council's 2018-2028 long-term plan and the funding impact statement, which forms part of the 2020-21 annual plan. I will move that a seconder and then open for conversation. Seconded by, Seconded by Councillor Edge. Um, all those conversation. conversations, sorry. So, so my uh, understanding of that is that there are councillors that want to make a comment on this. Uh, and so this is your opportunity. So Councillor Mackay. Thank you, Chair. I just feel I do have to make a comment on this one because I did not agree to the 4% rate rise in the plan that we have, have adopted. I cannot support um, this resolution in uh, 4, which includes uh, particularly the general rates component. Some of it may be in some others, but um, rather than ask for them to be separate, I just want that noted. Thank you very much. Any other comment on that? Uh, Councillor Hand. Yeah, just like Councillor Mackay, consistent with my comments earlier, I, I, I just state that I won't be supporting. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, with those two comments, I'll put it to the meeting that uh, item four or recommendation four under 9.3 um, for your voting. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? Councillor Hands and Councillor Mackay, do you want your vote recorded? As being against, thank you. Could, could, could I record a vote of abstinence? Councillor McKenzie abstain, abstaining from the vote. Um, and it's, uh, <clears throat> the next item is 9.4 fees and charges, special consultative pros, procedures. And again, uh, this is on page 147 to 143 of the agenda. And again, I'll hand over to Councillor Sunkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this paper comes to us um, following uh, our lockdown and since through COVID, we had uh, previously agreed that we would go out on a special consultative procedure under the Act. Uh, this was uh, or did not happen due to COVID. So this paper, in essence, just brings us back to realign our timeframes to ensure that we can uh, go out and have that consultation. Um, it was agreed at our 12th March meeting that we would do this. It has not been possible, and we therefore seek approval for initiation on 1st of July 2020 of a special consultative process or procedure as set out in the Local Government Act 2002, Section 83, to consult the community on increasing consent planning officer charge out rates in the environment and canary fees and charges policy. Have a mover for that, please. Councillor and a seconder, Councillor Clearwater. I'm not too sure if we need any further discussion on this. This has been before us for uh, on a number of occasions, pretty well explained. Um, so I'm just happy enough to put that to the vote. So all of those, everyone happy with that? Say aye. aye. All those against, say nay. Carried. The next two items, 9.5 and 9.6, we're going to swap them over because it's just um, in terms of lining them up properly, that's what we should be doing. Uh, that's the advice. So we'll take uh, item 9.6, and 9.6 is on page one, uh, contained between pages 156 and 159, and it uh, adopts the attached advanced draft street strategic direction uh, 2020 uh, 20 to 2023. And again, I don't think that we need any round the house debate on this and if anyone if everyone's happy that we just move this we shall move it um 
I, I see I, I see Councillor Pauling unhappy with the colours. Uh, can I just remind Councillor Pauling, councillors don't do colours. That's a staff matter. Councillor Clear, what did you want to? Just briefly, Mr. Chairman. Um, in, in the past, I've um, sort of had difficulty understanding the meaning of the term "our values," and I um, was saying to Craig earlier. In fact, I, I think I now get it. In fact, that all of those values actually also imply what we are about in terms of the actions we take as well. So it's more just than what's in the heart. It's just so in, in, in the whole way we do things. And I certainly um, now, now appreciate that. Good, thank you for that. Um, I think that's a point well made. Uh, so I'll just put it to the vote. All those in favour of this, please say aye. Aye. All those against? Oh, did we have more? Oh, did yeah, we did, didn't we? Nicole? I'll see and Lance. Sorry. Right, okay. I told Liz, I told uh, Louise we'd be finished by ten two, but I don't know if we're going to do it. That's right. <laughs> so I'll put this again. We have a move by Councillor Marshall and move and seconded by Councillor Farmer. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. All those against, carried. So, so congratulations, councillors, on a new strategic direction. <laughs> so yeah, well done, councillors. Uh, again. Again, 9.5, which is uh, we'll move to, which is the local government statement, uh, pages 154 to 155 on the agenda, plus uh, an attachment, uh, if I can get my hands on it, which was, I think you will have anyway, which is this one. Sure. Yep, which was being uh, included in your, in your, in your papers. Um, and again, uh, it's a procedural matter, really, in terms of the recommendation on page 154. Four, and I'll get to that when I do. So, it's all right. It's all right. I thought I was going to fall off the chair. No. Um, approves the local government statement in the form attached. So, I'll put that to the meeting. Move it. Moved by Councillor Pauling, seconded by Councillor Hands. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, yep. carry. May I suggest a second resolution as well? Um, as you're aware, we're hoping to add Toreo headings throughout the document. We've not been able to get the translations ready for today. So if you thought it appropriate, could I also recommend you delegate to the Chief Executive to incorporate those Toreo headings into the um, LGS in that form? Thank you, Catherine, for lining us up on that. Um, and you're happy that that resolution is in hand in terms of you can... If the move and a second are happy with that. Yeah, yes. so we've got to move. So moved by Claire, seconded by... Uh, oh, sorry, we already had a move and a second. The same move and a second. Oh, the like same move and a second. Yeah, they make it... Councillor yeah. Marshall, councillors. Yeah, together, yeah. I moved it. OK. Sorry. And the second it was? Who was the oh, second? Councillor Hand. Councillor Hand. Councillor Hand. You happy? OK, all those in favour. Thank you. All those against? Kerry. Really quick comment. Um, this local government statement, or I can't remember the exact title, and the strategic direction, it's part of stuff we have to do. But again, I just wanted to comment, because of our staff, it's done so clearly and so well that we are in a position where we can just put this stuff through without conversation. So I just really want to acknowledge that and thank you so much for the work that goes into these documents that, yeah, it's it's just fantastic where they've got to. So thank you. OK, can we move now to item 9.7? <clears throat> And it's the approval of the contract for services for Chatham Islands Council, uh, pages 160 to 161, Councillor Sunkel. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. Now that it's ticked over 10 to uh, 2, I won't have to make a long speech because uh, <laughs> we've got past that. Um, there are two recommendations here uh, to Council that uh, Council agrees to Environment Canterbury renewing its contract with the Chatham Islands Council for a further one-year term. 
<coughs> until 30 June 2021 and delegates authority to the Director of Financial and Corporate Services to uh, finalise and sign the contract. And, and just, just a couple of points of note, uh, the reason that it is coming to Council is, is a, a contract to the value of approximately 1.3 million. So with all contracts, there's, there's potentially a risk. So we just need to be aware of, of the value of that contract, not that there should be a risk. Uh, this is a contract for service with ECAN being the contractor. So uh, we are literally the contractor providing the service. Uh, the proposal is to roll over for one year. Uh, Chatham Islands Council, uh, Department of Internal Affairs and Environment Canterbury staff are in agreement with the proposal and uh, the Department of Internal Affairs are in, in essence the, the significant funder of uh, the Chatham Islands Council. So if the money dries up, we can blame central government. Um, the intervention of COVID has prevented uh, Christchurch uh, the Chatham Islands Council and, and ourselves engaging with DIA to discuss the improvements to the contract, um, but these will occur over the year. And uh, the final point is that this contract washes its face. There is no cost to us, uh, and we have a, a, a reasonable reserve to, to cover any eventualities that, that might come into play. So quite happy to uh, move the first two recommendations and seek a seconder. Uh, seconded. So seconded by Councillor Marshall. Is there any discussion? Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. All those against, carried. Thank you. Now we're at our item 10, which is uh, <clears throat> public excluded. So could I have a mover that, so thank you that we move into public excluded. Thank you, uh, Councillor Clearwater and a seconder. Thank you, Councillor e uh, Elizabeth McKenzie. So we clear the room. Yeah. Back when you're ready. Yeah. Okay. So we'll stop the recording for just a moment. Yeah. Oh, which we could have stayed the first one. Okay. That's fine. No problem. That's you can do it that way. So now, um, now we're out of public excluded. There was a, a recommendation in public excluded to bring some information out of public excluded that John Sunkel would allude to, please. Uh, around the Kayanga site, I've had a conversation with Miles, uh, a wee bit of not sure about the dollar values, but we would like to you to have a conversation with Miles as to what's appropriate to bring out around the concept and, and just protect the numbers if required. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just have... So I'll go through that again. This is uh, uh, item 11, other business. There is no other business. Uh, item 12, notices of motion. We've received no notices of motion. Uh, 13 questions. There are no questions. The next meeting of this council will be the Thursday, on Thursday the 23rd of July 2020 in this, in this chamber. And can I go to Councillor Hands for a closing karakia? Now, feel free for anybody to join me because I think in the spirit of us all learning and we've had a discussion about it and it's appropriate. So we'll do Una here. Una here. So Una here, Una here, Una here, Kitty Uru Tapu Nui Otani. Kia Watia, Kia Mama, Tinako, Titinana, Tiwaru Eti Aratakata, Koyara, 
e rongo, whaka aere, I always mark this part up, sorry, whaka aere ake ki runga, ki a tina, tina, haumi e, hui e, tai ki e. Well done, guys. Thank you very much. Councillor, that was superb. Thank you. And well done to you, truly. Yeah. And so now uh, we've got three minutes or two minutes. Oh, no, she is. I'm sorry, man. My response is very efficient.